appreciate all of you that were on time today. So we are going to start on time at 9. Um, I like to make sure that we acknowledge that you were all here at the exact moment we're going to start today. So hopefully when you came back today, you brought your trimester, as we will possibly be um, referring back to some of those, and one of them we will be actually getting into today. And then hopefully also you brought a picture book or a trade book that is in your realm and then your dibbles data, or you might just have access to it via electronically, that's fine as well. Um, and then your core basal program, or whatever you're using as your core instruction. So that's what we'll be going through today. Um, if you haven't had a chance, make sure you please sign in in the back. Um, Liz is going to send out an email today to all of you so that you have access to the G drive, where we're keeping all of the handouts in an electronic version, and the PowerPoint so that you have access to all of those things as well, so that you are welcome to share it amongst anyone that isn't here today, or we would love it if you would share it with others that couldn't make it today and yesterday. Um, so you will have access to that. If for some reason at lunchtime, if you could just pop in and check on your email, and if you didn't get it, we just don't have your email or we don't have it correctly, so if you could just let Liz or myself know what your email is and that you didn't get it, we will definitely make sure that you would get that really today. So for today, when we kind of look at the agenda for the day, we're going to be starting with vocabulary, so that will be the beginning of the day. Then we'll move into small group instruction and how to sort our kids and then what we should do for each of those groups. After that, we'll be talking about what we need to do for our high ability learners, because I'm certain you all have some of those in your classes as well. And then if we have time, we'll be talking about the difference between reading at home and reading at school, as you know. Um, if you've been in any of Jen's presentations this year, she's been um, pushing to kind of replace the you have to read for exactly 20 minutes at home and, and no more no less and so as adults we don't do that I think I think I'm allergic to technology I think that's what's really happening um, <laughs> so uh, we'll we'll try to get the microphones to work a little bit better today as well but trying to give you some other options for that as well to building literacy at home and then we'll be talking about goal setting in the very like last 15 minutes of the day so our outcomes for today are learning intentions and success criteria. Um, we're hopefully that you'll be able to explore your critical components of your explicit vocabulary routine, so we'll be talking about um, an instruction and routine today. And then you'll be able to explore and align your instructional supports with your students and their, based on their level of skills and deficits. And then our success criteria, hopefully you'll be able to incorporate some of those critical components, uh, components that you're learning from our um, explicit vocabulary routine today, and then as well as sort your students to identify their skill gaps, and then go ahead and have some ideas and some resources to fill in those gaps so that we put them where they're needed. Maybe it's just this side of the room. Maybe I'll just stand on this side of the room. We'll see if that helps. So with vocabulary. So I don't, have any of you ever had the chance to hear Louisa Motes speak at some other conference? She's, she's lovely, um, if you ever get that chance. but. So vocabulary is the most important single factor in accounting for reading comprehension. So when you're thinking about that, yesterday when we talked about the code, so you know when we did the, <laughs> when I had to teach you how to read a, a whole new language and you were, you were working through that with some, um, some strengths and some weaknesses, but when you were thinking about that, if I hadn't have given you that code, it would have been significantly more difficult. And because it was such a hard task, you weren't able to comprehend. So our students that already have the code, they're excellent at decoding, they might even be able to read fluently at an appropriate rate with great accuracy, they might not have any idea what those words mean. I'm sure if I gave you a medical text right now, none of us are doctors I'm assuming in here, um, but we'd be able to probably decode the words in it, we would have no idea what they mean. Right? That's, that's not where our schema and background is. So it's the same thing with vocabulary. It's kids that might have the code, they might be able to read it, decode it, but they aren't going to be able to comprehend if they don't have that vocabulary piece in. So vocabulary actually, um, if you think about vocabulary in, in the way of getting to comprehension, it can change at 50 to 60% if they don't have the vocabulary needed for comprehension. So when thinking about that, we're going to watch this short video on, actually it's not that short, it's a little bit long, on meaningful differences. What I want you to do is kind of be taking notes when you're thinking about this, and then at the end, we're going to have some turn and talk time about what these meaningful differences going on in homes mean for us as educators and what we need to do to support our students. And the title of the book, Meaningful Differences in the Everyday Experience of Young American Children. Hold 
out your arms, stand there, stop, get down from there, come here, who gave you that? What are, you know, who, you know, in other words, it's, it's talking to accomplish something, okay? And it turns out that the amount of business talk was a constant, no matter how much the family talked. In other words, if they talked a little, there was a certain amount of that same amount of it. If they talked a lot, there was only that same amount. They didn't do more business talk when they talked more. The topics were different. It was about something else. So that if, if the parents only talked a little, it was all business talk. The relationship between that, that, that what we saw parents doing in non-business talk, the children are one or two years old. Okay. Seven, eight, with their Stanford Binet IQ test scores at age three. 36.78. Okay. We, f okay, we, uh, we have to kind of remember. Then we eliminate the relationship of the welfare, the us and them. We eliminate the professional, you know, doctors and lawyers and such, and we eliminate the welfare, we just get middle America, white collar, and blue collar, you know, jobs and so on, working class. Say, okay, is there, what's the relationship between the extra talk and the child's IQ scores for just that middle America? 0.77. Okay, we follow the kids into the third grade. Okay, uh, the relationships are so strong. You know, in terms of outcome, and that's that's the other discovery. How strong the talkativeness, especially when you some you know you cut up the business stuff, the chit chat, the commentaries, the with um, child intellectual outcome is you know as, as strong as the data will the, the the measures will allow. It's that notion of, of, of language and words and vocabulary size that is you know, big in terms of cognitive implications. But it's also the other th effect of what we said was extra words are feel good. They're not business. They're, they have affirmations in them. They have active listening. They have restatements of the child's. They have responsive terms. And so, if we think about it in terms of the emotional life of the child, if, we hit, if a child's in a taciturn family, they are apt to hear prohibitions that they're wrong more often than they're right from their parents. Not, and, and in a very talkative family, their family might, they might hear they're wrong that often, but they'll hear that they're right five or six more times more often. They're still hearing that they're wrong. That's right. Instrumental on all sides. That, that's right. But they're not having these positive counterbalance. That's right. E exactly. You know, think about a lifetime battery average of that. You know, sort of like in terms of, of uh, you know, uh, you've heard 750,000 times you're right by the time you're, you're four, and you heard 120,000 times you're wrong. Versus heard it hearing 250,000 times you're wrong and 120,000 times you're right. Those are life things. You can't overcome those with positive experience. When we begin to look at outcome in terms of child vocabulary size, it wasn't SES, it was talkativeness. So we can sort it out. In other words, the, the relationship between the amount of talking and child vocabulary size, child IQ test scores, and so on, was so was large, and there wasn't anything left over once you took that out. Once you turn them out talking, there was no SES or race left. Differences left after after amount of talking. And so we think we've got at what's in socioeconomic that in the relationship between poverty or socioeconomic status and child achievement. So when thinking about this morning, we were talking about vocabulary and how it accounts for 50 to 60 percent of the variance in reading comprehension, and also thinking about the difference in depending on where what family they grew up in, and I mean, he talked about even the vast differences in language between 
between various families. What does that mean for us as educators in the classroom? So go ahead, turn to a partner. It could be the same partner as yesterday, maybe a different partner. Um, and you can even talk, talk in a small group and discuss what this means for us as educators and what we can do in the classroom to help our students. to not only be verbal through a written language, but verbal and have that discussion time with each other, not just with the teacher. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Would you mind? I just was thinking about a student that I have that's so extremely shy that she barely can even talk. And she's a fairly good reader, but it was interesting in all of this because she, I mean, she's <laughs> to even talk things out. And I think, I wonder what the comparison in, you know, she's not talking, but she's listening to other people, but I wonder what the comparison is. Yeah, I would wonder that as well. I was just thinking of the standards, the speaking and listening standards, and how I don't really focus on them much because I'm more concerned with can they write and can they read and things like that. And I'm just curious how teachers that effectively use those standards and, you know, what difference does that make in the reading scores and in the writing scores? And anyway, I haven't thought about that before. Yes. Lots of lots of good thoughts. I'm glad. It is kind of a longer video, but I hopefully you got as much out of it as I did. Hi. So I work at a Title I school, and a lot of times we're concerned about our kids who are coming, who are ESL students, but we because we're Title I, what we really need to be understanding is that most of our kids are language impoverished. And the, the things that we do through our techniques to try to reach out to our ESL kids could be very valuable to reaching out those same techniques to the kids who just didn't come with that language exposure their whole lives. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you all for sharing. 
Um, so we're thinking about these and ways that we need to bring vocabulary into our classroom. And we know that we are all time poor, don't have a lot of extra time, so we need to be thinking about how we can bring these in when we're already doing other things that we already are doing on a daily basis. So one way to bring in new voc vocabulary is read-alouds, and we'll actually go through this book a little bit later today. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, Super Red Riding Hood. It's pretty, pretty great. So, um, <clears throat> But when thinking about that, it's a very powerful context for, for kids to be learning new words. Um, and then the books that we're choosing, of course. I know, I don't know, did any of you ever um, watch Reading Rainbow when you were? Yeah. I'm trying to remember what his name is. Um, <laughs> thank you, yes. Um, <laughs> so when thinking of that, anytime he was like talking about a book and really just you know, the, putting basically a big fat star on it, I was like, ooh, I have to go find that in my library. Did anyone else feel like that? So, um, whenever he was thinking, you know, this book is so great, and this is what it's about, and I'm so excited, and I hope you read it too, I was like, I want to read it too. Um, so when thinking about that, it, it can motivate kids as well when we're thinking of, if we go ahead and, you know, display a book and talk about how great it is and how excited we are, kids are going to want to go and check that out as well. Um, <clears throat> A little bit more motivating but there's basically two main ways of acquiring new words when we're thinking about this we have the incidental vocabulary learning which is like through rich oral language experiences and when we're talking about those we're talking about using full academic sentences in our classrooms so I know a lot of times I'll walk into classrooms and I'll hear a lot of the business talk that he was talking about and you know like please put that away stop doing that or you know a lot of the business talk but I'm, I'm wanting to hear a little bit more of that rich oral vocabulary and those full academic sentences. And a lot of times as teachers, if we get the answer, we're usually like, okay, and then we move on because we're so, we have so much to get done and we are aware of that. But it's really important to require our students, even in kindergarten, to give us their answer in a full academic, complete academic, academic sentence. And when they're, when they're doing that, obviously in kindergarten, this might be the first time anyone's ever asked them to speak in a complete sentence. And so when we're talking about academic sentences, we might have to give them a sentence frame of how to start those and eventually wean them off that throughout the year. But can you imagine if a student had that requirement in their grade from kindergarten on how different the academic language would be in sixth grade by the time they got there would be a huge difference. Especially when they're not hearing not only their teacher with that, but as we talked about having time to have students have that conversation with others. So they're hearing those full academic sentences from other students as well, not just from the teacher. And then a wide range of reading. So that could be your teacher read alouds. And, and by wide, we mean on a variety of different themes and subjects and, and genres. And independent reading. In K-1, it's not so much on the independent reading because I don't know if you've um, noticed, but um, <laughs> and Jen talks about this a lot, but a lot of times the silent sustained reading, the silent sustained staring, right? The kids who want to read are going to read. The kid, it's, it's like the Matthew effect, right? So the kids who want to read are going to get more and more time reading. The kids who don't want to read or don't feel like they're comfortable reading, they'll do the whole look at the page, the kid next to me turn, oh, it's time to turn, okay. And then they're, oh, their eyes are moving, so I'll move my eyes like that. And then, oh, they turn the page, and I'll turn the page too. So they're, they're very good at faking reading, right? But excellent staring. Um, but being mindful that that's not really being beneficial to all of our students. It's only being beneficial to the ones who really don't even need more time with that. So thinking of those pieces. And then intentional vocabulary teaching. So that's what we're going to actually talk about today. We actually have a lesson. Um, we're going to read through an article quick, but after that we're, we have little book barks that have the explicit vocabulary instruction on them that you are welcome to laminate and <clears throat> use in your classroom if you wish. But it's, it's looking at a rich and robust group of words that we're teaching. We know that we can't teach every single word, so be mindful that we're only teaching the ones that really have the most use out of them. Um, like the word trident, we were in a classroom and someone was talking about Greek mythology, and the teacher was explaining the word trident for like, you know, eight to ten minutes. And it's like, how often do you guys use the word trident? Like, never, right? And you're like, oh, I don't think I've heard that in forever. So, I mean, if we're taking the time to teach meaningful words, let's make sure that they're ones that are actually useful, that we can use more than once. Um, and maybe you could obviously talk about what a trident is and show them the picture, and the picture was already in the story, so it was there, you can refer to it, this is what a trident is, and then just kind of move on and teach the more useful words. Um, and then word learning strategies. So we're talking about these, and obviously you'll notice dictionary uses at the bottom. That's because it's not the best way to be teaching vocabulary. I know a lot of times, at least when I was in school, it was, this is how you learn the vocabulary. I'm going to assign you words, and you're going to look them up in the dictionary. How well did that teach me vocabulary? Not real well. 
And <laughs> even now, if I'm reading an academic paper for school, I'll be reading, I'll come to where I'm like, oh, I've never heard that word. I can decode it. I have no idea what it means, so of course my comprehension then is low, but what do I do? I'll go to dictionary.com or Merriam-Webster, and I'll look it up and then, oh, okay. But then I still I have to like write myself a little note, and I have to connect the two words I already know. So as an adult, I have these strategies in place, but if we just assign and give kids a dictionary, that's not enough even for me as an adult to remember what it is. And even then, I still have to look it up probably several times before I really get the meaning down. Um, but when thinking about that, and I know you'll notice the cognitive awareness for EL, so when we're thinking about that, I, and I, it was mentioned back here, that a lot of the things we're doing for EL students are the same things that we would be doing for students who already know English, right? Like having the, the, picture, the visual cues for kids is very helpful. Um, we know some of our kids are coming from those families that don't have as much oral language background, and, or only have the negative, like you, was that surprising to you, the, the sheer number of just negative, just negative versus the positive? That was, I, I found that very disheartening to hear um, when I think about so many kids and they go home. So we're thinking about this, you have an article, it looks like this, it starts with page six, and on the top it says all about words, but it starts with myth one. So what I want you to do is I want you to get in a group of five, and so you might have to do a little bit of movement here, but once you get into group five, I want you to assign someone's going to be number one, someone's going to be number two, and so on. Once you decide who is going to be what, you're going to take time and read, someone's going to read, obviously, number one, we'll read myth one. And what you're going to do is you have, let me see if I can find it here. You have a note-taking device on the back of that packet, and what I want you to do is whatever myth that you are assigned to read, go ahead and take your notes on there, because what you're going to be doing then is sharing out with the rest of your team and teaching them about your myth. And so once once they are then sharing the myth with you, then you're going to take notes on that for the myth that they share with you. So go ahead, groups of five, assign who's going to be number one, two, three, four, and five, and then you can start reading, and then we'll stop, and then we'll go ahead and have some discussion time. Four, three, two, one.
Whoever wins over myth one, so myth one, go first. I'm going to give you one minute to share with your group, and your group can take notes while that one minute is timer. When the timer goes off, then we'll move on to myth number two, being shared. It really just escapes me. Um, if you Google and look up the Longman Pearson, or is it Pearson Longman? I wrote it down. Longman. It's Pearson Longman um, Dictionary. It has really great student-friendly definitions for you so that you don't have to be on the spot and think, how can I make this, and wasting your instructional time doing that. Um, go ahead and Google that. But maybe it's something you already have in your building or somebody you already have that you might have access to. Um, but it has really great student-friendly definitions that you can use for the students. Will you say that again? Say again. Yes, Pearson Longman. P-E-A-R-S-O-N. Pearson. And then Longman, just like Longman. Yeah. So that's a good one that you could be using. Um, making, making sure that we're highlighting words prior to the text that are integral to the story. So you'll notice when I'm going to be reading this story today, I won't read the whole thing to you, of course, because you're adults, but I'll give you enough context to do the activity. Um, <laughs> but when we're looking at that Thinking about, I'm going. If I were teaching to children, I would pre-teach three specific words that I want them to be thinking about and looking at. So doing the same thing with kids. If there are specific words that you want to pre-teach prior to actually reading, and of course, if you're doing that, you need to have read the story prior to. So I know sometimes I'll walk into a classroom and it's clear that the teacher has, is now for the first time reading that story. So making sure that we read the story and picking out those, those meaningful words beforehand is really important. And then making children aware of the meaning of the words so they can engage into that meaningful context. So when we're thinking about giving them the synonyms and antonyms, and hopefully that is able to giving them some connections to connect their known knowledge or their new knowledge to their known knowledge, and making sure that they're thinking, oh well, I've heard of that word. I know what that word means. If it's kind of like that, I, I can make that connection. Principle two: being intentional about our word selection. And so thinking about if we can only teach about 400 words in a year. But a student is learning five to six thousand in a year. We certainly don't have time to teach five to six thousand in a year, right? So if we only have time to teach four hundred, we have to be really purposeful in the words we're choosing and making sure they're going to be high utility words. Um, the other way that we're able to get those. No, I appreciate you guys are having a great conversation. Um, <laughs> um, so when thinking about that, um, if we only have four hundred that we can teach in a year thinking about breaking that down, and, and maybe you even break down, I know some of your coaches in the room, breaking that down with your teachers as to how many does that mean in a month, how many does that mean in a week. If you, if, I mean, if you want to break that down, that would be absolutely fine to do with them. But focusing on those, making sure they're high utility. And that the content. Maybe it's only over here, so I cannot move towards the table, okay? Um, <laughs> content related for, that's critical and, and vital for them developing those context clues and thinking about this isn't just in language arts, right? This is included in science, in social studies, in math, um, music, art, all of these other subjects, right? So it's not just going to happen in ELA time. So thinking about that as well. 
and then building those word meaning through the, these knowledge networks. So maybe you've done these before, where you're kind of thinking of, uh, as a, a theme, and so you're identifying those interconnections and those concepts for the kids. Not all kids will make those connections automatically, and so it's important that we make those, help them make those and draw those connections. And then how do these words work together? So if you're talking about transportation, oh, question. I'm sorry, can I, I just say, okay, I want to go back. Oh, you want me to go back? Yeah, I'd be happy to go back. When we're talking about teaching 400 words a year and the vocabulary that these little kids can put in their heads, and we want them to have an academic language. Yes. Okay. Yep. So it tier two words. Mm -hmm. not just be what's in your basal, because doesn't that 400 words have to also include like what it takes to be, okay, I want to make sure I say this right. No, I so appreciate it. So I mean, thinking about if I already know that my kids know that word, certainly not. But if you're noticing that nobody knows that word, absolutely, it would need to take that time. Because if you're going to be using it as a teacher and thinking about, oh, oh I see lots of great hands. Um, and, and I hope you guys have something lovely to share as well. Um, but thinking about what's most meaningful, thinking about those tier two words, that's what we're really thinking about, teaching those explicitly. Yeah, I was just going to say using the word like solve or find. That can be a tier two word for math that you're pulling across to another content area. So you're actually giving them more exposure to it and talking about the different meanings as well. So it's definitely a word you can pull it. I believe there's a hand over here. Right. Sorry. Nope. <laughs> well, I can just talk less. I just think that talking about academic language is really helpful too because yesterday I was just telling her that. Our kindergarten teacher at our school, she loves to call period sentence sparkles, which is adorable and cute. But when they when the first graders come to me, you know, they have no idea what a period is because they've heard it with a sentence sparkle all year. So like teaching academic language is so important because I feel like it goes along with like taking away and minus two. Like you can use taking away, but you know, talking about those connections, like you said, even if like you're making a web of like taking away is also minus and also subtract. So like using those academic languages, even when you do things like yes, sparkles. yes. And, and in case you didn't hear her, she was saying that um, there's a kindergarten teacher who is using instead of the word period at the end of the sentence, she calls them sentence sparkles. So then when they come to first grade, they don't know what a period is um, because it's a sentence sparkle. So <laughs> making sure that yes. In those, in those same respects. And I mean, having these conversations, you could even have these conversations with parents as well. I mean, how many of you have had a kindergartner come in and they see a train and they say it's a choo-choo and you're like, no friend, it's a train. So be mindful that it is important to use the right words and bringing that in so they understand that. It's, it's fine if they want to know that the sentence sparkle is also a period, great, but I would probably just tell them it's a period and give them the right words in the first place. Um, but be mindful of that, absolutely. So making sure that they're very important words, because if we only have 400, they've got to be good, right? <laughs> they've got to be good. Um, before we move on, any other, anybody else want to ask? Oh, yeah. Do you have a list of tier two words, talking about words that would move across different subjects? Is there some place we could reference that? I'm sure there are if you Google. I don't have a list. I know there's actually a book. It's like six hundred dollars. Okay. <laughs> you don't need to buy that. Larry, Larry Bell. Oh, has say it really loud. Oh, sorry. 
Larry Bell has done, um, he's done a lot of research and talked about that. Also, there's a guy right now, I'm trying to remember his name, he's actually local, but he's done, kind of broken them down and, anyway, I think his name is Smith, but you can just do tier two vocabulary list and you'll get all sorts of information. Just look in the core people. That word that keeps coming up over and over again, solve, demonstrate, identify, compare, those are the words you need to be teaching. Yep. Okay, thank you so much. All right. So when thinking about principle three, so building the word meaning through the knowledge networks, and we're thinking about how do these words work together and making those connections for the students, helping them make those connections, and making sure that these words um, are presented in an integrated text, and so we've kind of already talked about that a little bit, but when you're looking at this as an example of transportation, students maybe have never traveled via water or air, and so maybe they're only familiar with transportation on land, and so making those other connections for them that you can travel in other manners, um, and that when we're talking about transportation, we're not only talking about transportation via land. So, thinking about that. Principle number four is children need repeated exposure to gain the knowledge, right? So just like I was saying, it takes me several times. I know I actually was telling Jen the other day that I swear there's this one word, and it's, it is in like every article I have to read for school, and every time I have to look it up. So clearly, I haven't had enough repetition to really have that word down. And at this point, I feel like I should have. So <laughs> when thinking about that, some kids can learn a new word in like three or four repetitions, okay? But it's very few, very few. Most of them, it's gonna be more like 24. So if we're thinking about that, that's something that's not just me telling them, it's them using it as well, right? So we have to give them that opportunity to be using these in context so that it's not just me. So I know um, Jen said, I can't remember what grade it was she was teaching at the time, but. Um, I want to say it was fourth grade, but they actually had just like a word wall that was for vocabulary words, and they had like a word or however many of the week, and so then it was that you got like a ticket, like basically like a ticket that you could buy, of course, we all know it's stuff in the dollar store, right? Um, but you could use however many tickets to buy something from the dollar store bin of stuff, um, and it motivated kids to use the words that they're learning, and so it was Anytime it, somebody heard, and it could have been in a student-to-student -student conversation, so another student could have given them a ticket and said, I heard you say blah, 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 and you used it in the right manner. And obviously, making sure they're using it in the right manner, not just randomly boarding it out in class, so um, that wouldn't really be ticket-worthy, so having <laughs> those expectations in place would be important as well. Um, but thinking about that, repeated reading is going to give kids that exposure too. Now, repeated reading kind of falls off after four times, so you don't really need to be reading the same story more than four times. It kind of falls off after that, but three to four times is pretty good for giving kids that knowledge. And when you're thinking about wide reading, and they're going to be reading on different themes and learning more and more information on that, that would be really beneficial for having that exposure as well. And then number five, which is again why you're here today, um, the ongoing professional development is essential. And so making sure that teachers are not only because I know a lot of us were thinking about, and I know it was in the myth um, article as well, but oftentimes it was just, you know, if the kids just hear it, they'll just kind of randomly pick it up, but that's really after, you know, that's really not what's happening. And so thinking about how can we implicitly and explicitly be teaching these words for the kids that are the most meaningful, when we can only pick 400, they've got to be really great, really good choices. But making sure that your teachers, and if you're coaches, um, or if you are teachers, bringing this back to their school, that you as well need more and more information and ongoing professional development on this so that you can do everything you can to help your kids. So, kind of adding on to this principle number five, the patterns of instruction involve. So this, these are kind of what we're talking about in steps. So identifying words we each taught, right? That's step one. So we need to help teachers figure out step one, how do we identify these words? And of course, grade to grade, it's not going to be the same group of words probably. You're hoping that they, if it was taught explicitly and very well and they had the 24 exposures or whatever in first grade, that we don't need to add that to the second grade list. So having some discussion time across grade levels as to, well, is this on your list? Because if you're doing it, it should be, I should know, oh, I don't really need to have that on my 400 list or whatever, and knowing that that's already been done. Number two, defining these words in a student-friendly way. So if you are using, you, you might be really good at that off the cuff. I'm not. And so using a student-friendly dictionary to help you with those terms and getting them a definition that's going to be most helpful with them, including antonyms and synonyms <laughs> and making connections to the words they already know. Three, contextualizing the words. And of course, varied and meaningful formats, right? So I know Amy brought up, 
if we're using some of these words, making sure we're using them across more than one different subject area and content area, and, and a lot of these words that are high utility can be done in that manner. Now before reviewing the words to ensure they're sustained, so right, not just like three and done, but we're going to need a lot of it. And then, again, it's not just us saying it that many times, it's the kids using it in a meaningful way in the right context that many times. And then the last one, monitoring their progress and reteaching if necessary. Because if we're not monitoring and we think, oh, I think I got that one, you might realize, oh, I really only had like 12 exposures, and it turns out that only worked for five kids in my class. So I'm going to need to do that a little bit more. So maybe another few days of that in a week. So I'm going to model kind of what this looks like with the text, the Super Red Riding Hood. And when I'm doing this, I'm, I'm going to fully admit right now, I am not a singer. All right? Not Britney Spears. So <laughs> being mindful of that, there is a little section in it. I'm going to kind of like sing songs, say it, but I'm not going to sing because I just don't get paid enough for that in front of adults. So <laughs> in front of children, sure, because they're not judging me. But come on, we're all adults here. We know how it works. So what I would do before I was reading this text is I would actually pre-teach certain words. So when I'm thinking about this specifically, and again, you have in your handouts this explicit vocabulary instruction routine. You're welcome to take a look at that and kind of be mindful that we are going to be using it after this. And again, when you're looking at those bookmarks, we'll talk about this a little bit in depth, but the first one is to display and say the words, but then we're going through and it kind of talks to you through the steps of that explicit vocabulary routine. So you're welcome to have those out as well. So I would re be reteaching the words danger, Trying to remember the other one. Oh, rescue. Danger, rescue, and afraid. So I would have pre-taught danger, rescue, and afraid to you, but because you're all adults and I feel like you're probably pretty solid with those three words, I'm not going to waste your time. So <laughs> knowing that, I'm going to go ahead and redo this book. And again, it's, if you aren't familiar with this book, it's called Super Red Riding Hood by Claudia Davila. Claudia Davila. Not far from here, near a small forest, lives a girl named Ruby. Ruby's favorite color is red. She loves red berries, her red boots, especially the red cloak her grandma, grandmother made for her. When Ruby put on her red cloak, she becomes super red riding hood. Everyone right now is like, I wish I had a red cloak. Right? One, sun, one sunny afternoon, Ruby was very busy playing superhero in her room when she heard her mother call from downstairs. Ruby, is, is, it, is it something important, Mom? She called back. It sure is. Looks like Super Red Riding Hood has an important mission, Ruby declared. So a mission, if that kids aren't familiar with that, maybe that would be one of my words as well. She threw on her red cloak and grabbed her flashlight. A superhero must be prepared for anything. <coughs> You've been out indoors all day, her mother said. Why don't you go pick some raspberries to have with your snack? This did not sound like an important mission to Ruby but she could see that her mom meant business. So, Ruby kissed her mom goodbye and set out along the path to the raspberry bushes with her lunchbox in hand. The woods are deep and dark and full of danger, Ruby said to herself, but Super Red Riding Hood is never scared. It's a very powerful quote, obviously. Ruby was marched along bravely when, oh no, Ruby's big red rubber boot almost crossed a tiny snail in the middle of the path. This is a dangerous place for a little snail, she said. <coughs> Luckily, Super Red Riding Hood is here to rescue you. She carefully moved the little snail out of harm's way. A good deep done, she said. Ruby skipped towards the wood. Who's afraid of the deep dark woods, the deep dark woods, the deep dark woods? Who's afraid of the deep dark woods? No, 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 no. Not me, she sang. When she got to the edge of the forest, she stopped and peered ahead. A chill drifted out from the shadowy darkness. A superhero must be silent like a cat and watch out for danger, Ruby whispered and tiptoed into the woods. The forest was full of strange noises. It was a very good thing she had remembered to bring her flashlight. Hoo hoo, crack. Owl, twig, woodpecker, she said aloud, shining her bright light toward the different sounds. Who's afraid of the deep dark woods, the deep dark woods, the deep dark woods? Who's afraid of the deep dark woods? Na 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 na, not me. She sang along as she walked. Before long, she came to a sunny clearing packed with raspberry bushes. 
She ran to fill her lunchbox with juicy red berries. Mission accomplished, she said triumphantly. She was just snapping her lunchbox closed when she heard a new sound, a big, rumbly, growly, terrifying sound. Ruby's tummy twisted in a knot. Her teeth began to chatter. A superhero must be brave, she reminded herself. Who's afraid of the... Okay, then I'll stop there. Um, hopefully you enjoy them. Um, and like I promised, no singing. So <laughs> you have the two handouts here. Um, the blue one with the explicit vo uh, vocabulary routine that we'll be going through today. Um, and then once we're going through that, you'll also have this explicit vocabulary routine. Because what I want you to be doing eventually is I'll be having you pick one from hopefully the book that you brought with you today, picking a few words to be included in here. And so you'll, I'll be going through this routine with you, and then I'll give you some time to actually go through to work on it on your own. So we're looking at that blue bookmark. You would display and say the word to the students, obviously not just to yourself. Um, <laughs> provide a student-friendly definition of the word. So if we're doing the word danger, which you'll notice in this example that you have in your packet, the word is danger. Everybody wants the word? Danger. OK, so the student-friendly definition is you're likely to get right in some manner. So that would be you're in danger. So, Identify the word parts, families, and or origin if possible, right? So that might be something that is unable for you to do. So you'll notice we have NA in our packet, but um, if that's possible, go ahead and do that. So they're making those connections. When you, the next piece is illustrate the word with examples and not examples, including pictures, gestures, etc. So you'll notice that there's a picture of a little girl. Clearly she was in some danger and it looks like she probably got hurt, right? So it's kind of including that student-friendly definition of likely to get hurt in that picture, so you're, you're making those connections for the students. And then check the student's understanding. When you're looking at checking for the student's understanding, you'll notice under ours, it's asking questions, having the students discern between examples, and of course, not examples. Right? We want to give them that context of, is this an example or is this a non-example? Having students generate their own examples is important so that you understand that are they really using that meaning, you're checking if they get it, and then providing a sentence starter and have them complete the sentence and of course making sure it's in a context that they would be using it incorrectly. So for example, this is just one way you could do it. I'm going to read a little example. If that example is using danger in the right way or is implicit in meaning that it's danger, I'm going to go ahead and say danger. Everybody, what are you going to say? Danger. Okay, if it's not, I want you to cross your arms and go, er. Can everyone try that? Er. All right, here we go. If I reached into a rose bush to get a lost ball, I would be in danger. Danger. Ooh, thank you. I'd be in danger if a little kitten came up and licked me. Danger. <laughs> oh, you guys look great. Walking through the forest alone may put me in danger. Danger. And then you would do some partner talk. So fill in the sentence, I might be in danger if I, and so hopefully you'd be able to check their understanding when we did that, and then deepen the student's understanding. So after that, you're, you're building those knowledge networks that we talked about. I think I even have a slide of that. Let's check. And then when you're done, you would review and coach and encourage the use. So here's the word danger, a time when maybe someone got hurt or maybe something bad happened. And I'd go through, because remember I said I would pre-teach danger, rescue, and afraid, so here are the other ones. <laughs> You're all like this. <laughs> Do you love how many like hilarious made pictures are on Google? I love that. Um, so when thinking about this, again, step one, read the word. Number two, you're embedding some kind of explicit vocabulary. You're picking three to five words, OK? So not like 20 words. Let's just go with three to five at this point and then defining those terms. So it's your turn. I want you to go through your story, and I'm going to leave this up just so you remember what steps you're looking at. I want you to do the first few steps. So you're gonna read it. Of course, you gotta read the story to know. Maybe you're very familiar with it, maybe not. Read the story if you're not. Find those three to five words. Go ahead and provide a student-friendly definition with those, and then we'll come back together. So I'm gonna give you some more time to do this. <laughs> um, 
Um, but thinking about danger, so in the book, it was rescued the snail because the snail was in danger. She sang a song to make her feel a little bit safer. I don't know if any of you did songs do that. She had a flashlight because she was trying to shine it on the things that might have been scary and might have made her think she was in danger. She tiptoed. Um, afraid, she was, it sounds like it could have been, tummy was twisted, that she was feeling afraid, um, afraid of the dark, a lot of kids are afraid of the dark, strange noises kind of frightened her, um, and then teeth chattering was, she was afraid. Um, so thinking about your knowledge networks that you'll be building with kids, pulling in things from the story is helpful, you can always pull in things that maybe would also be beneficial from outside the story. And then assessing the vocabulary, so it could be as simple as Thumbs up or thumbs down, am I using it right? The thing that we did where we were errant, if it was wrong. It can be something very brief, quick, and simple like that. These are just some examples of here's a loan for its signature, and if it's being used in the right manner. Now, obviously, in kindergarten, you're thinking some of my kids could maybe read those and do it on their own. Some of them would need my support. Absolutely. Um, and then, like the fish, yes, no. So it could just be as simple as Circle the smiley face if I used it correctly. Circle the frowny face if I didn't. So when you're thinking about the assess assessment, it doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be something <laughs> quick, thumbs up, thumbs down, or um, that sort of thing. Or it could be uh, on a paper version. So I want to give you the time to add those last couple pieces of the knowledge network and the repetition in there. Thinking about how can I get this in there and repeat it enough. What are some ideas that I could do in class during the week? to get that repetition in. So it doesn't all have to be in one day, right? Because you can refer back to the story. If you're doing a repeated reading with a story, maybe by the time you've read it a fourth time, then maybe you've gotten all 24 or however many repetitions needed it, right? So, and assessing, of course, will tell you, if I don't need the 24, then okay, great, right? Maybe I can stop at 20. Maybe that was enough for all of my kids to gather that information. And be using that word in the context correctly. So I'm going to give you some time now. Again, what I'm going to do is Hopefully you can still hear me one that believes that life happened. Um, at 10.30, we're going to come back together. So this is a work time and your break. So if you don't need a break, feel free to continue working. If you do need a break, feel free to go and take care of your needs. Um, and then, again, we're going to start back at 10.30. I'm going to... MTSS, it's the multi-tiered systems of support, and doesn't just include 
um, kids that need intervention, it includes every student. So when we're thinking about that, we're encompassing everybody. You will need at some point, not exactly right now, but I'm just kind of getting you ready. You can kind of put your vocabulary handouts aside, and you're welcome to them pull out this big packet that you you were given yesterday. Don't have it with you or you forgot it there are some extra copies in the back I believe um, so just be aware of that but you will be needing this shortly and then there's also a methods for increasing intensity and it has four squares on the back so either either side you are going to be wanting to look for that shortly as well and again if you don't have it or didn't bring it back from yesterday this one's not from yesterday it's from today but if for some reason you don't have that you can visit Mel in the back Mel can get you what you need so when talking about the multi-tiered systems of support, we're thinking about the bottom of the triangle, which is, you know, in this case, it's the greenish part. But we're talking about the 80 to 90 percent of students mean performance. So if we're looking at a strong core instruction model, it needs to the needs of 80 percent of our students. Um, if it's not meeting 80 percent of the needs of our students, then we know that there is a core instruction issue. So when we're thinking about that sometimes, and, I, and by a raise of hands, have you ever had kids go on intervention and maybe it was done by an interventionist or someone other than you, maybe outside the classroom, and they basically graduated from intervention and came back to the classroom for a few weeks and then again fell below? Anybody ever had that happen? Okay, so sometimes when that happens, it, it tells us that there's a core instructional issue. So whatever the core instructional problem is, it, if the kids graduated from intervention and they're good to go, they're back on track, and then you put them back in the classroom with only core instruction and they're not able to handle that, that's a problem. That means there's a core instructional issue. So I know when I was an instructional coach, sometimes we would send kids in, they would come do our intervention program, they'd be great, we would monitor them um, for three weeks after they graduated before completely releasing them. We'd make sure that they were not just at benchmark, but they were above before we released them. And then we put them back in the classroom, and then three weeks later, they would lovingly come back to us. And um, <laughs> that was always really frustrating. Um, so be mindful of that kind of the middle section of the triangle is that 5 to 10% that are going to need some supplemental support. They don't need extreme intensive support, but they do need some support. And then at the very top, it's only the 1 to 8% of students that really require some very intensive intervention. So sometimes people will think that the very top is students that are requiring special ed needs, but it's not always. There are kids that need tier three support and they are not in special ed and don't need to be. So being mindful of that, making sure that we're matching our instruction to the need of our student outcomes, what their deficits are, what they need. This includes academics, behavior, and coaching all together in one. So when we're thinking about tier one, so if we head back to tier one, Tier 1 is including everyone, so every single student in the class, in the school, is getting Tier 1. If we have students who aren't getting Tier 1, so for example, so I, if you're familiar with the UCA, the Utah Consolidated Applications Network, um, I review every single K-3 plan and um, OEK plan that comes from the state, which is super fun. Um, <laughs> when, when I'm doing that though, like I just got one last week, for example, that um, it said that very explicitly, for tier one, not everyone is included. And I was like, oh, tears. Um, so if, if we are expecting kids to be on grade level, and then we're pulling them out of grade level, guess what? They're not ever going to be grade level. We have to give them access to that and scaffold it for their needs, but they have to have access to it. So when you're pulling kids, if it's a pull out method, it cannot be during your tier one time. So if you have a 120 minute literacy block, we cannot pull kids out during that time for intervention because if they're not getting the 120 minutes of your core instruction, then we have an issue. They're not going to meet grade level needs. So we're thinking about tier two. These are kids that need more support. Okay, so this is like, again, it's not everybody. It's kind of in that middle section. So they're identified through screening. So you might be using dibbles. Maybe if you're kindergarten, it might have been the KEEP assessment used this year. Um, but those who are at risk. Okay, so anyone who's at risk for some poor learning outcomes. The instructional content is targeted and supplemental. And by supplemental, we mean, again, it doesn't occur during that 120 minutes of, of time. It occurs at a later time, okay, a different time. Um, it's in addition, it might be small groups. I would start with six, because if they can handle six, you're obviously going to be able to get at way more kids if you have groups of six than if you only have groups of two. Um, but groups of five or six, 
provided that they need the same skill, obviously. If I have a kid that needs PA, a kid that needs phonics, and a kid that needs fluency, probably not all going to be in the same group. Um, it's provided by the classroom teacher, maybe in some instances. It might be provided by an interventionist or someone else, maybe even a coach. In the setting, it's probably in the general education classroom, but again, it might not be. It might be somewhere else. You might have intervention rooms or somewhere else. Um, and then the assessments that you'd be using with these students would be progress monitoring and some diagnostic assessments. So when we're thinking about progress monitoring, for students who are struggling and they need tier two but not a ton of, they're not intensive, you'd probably progress monitor them approximately every two to four weeks depending on kind of where they're at. If they're kind of closer to being at grade level, they just need a little bit of support, maybe I'd only progress monitor them once a month, but if they're a little bit closer to that intensive area, I'd probably progress monitor them every other week to make sure I'm getting them the needs that they need. I would also be using Pathways of Progress with them. How many are familiar with Pathways of Progress? About half. Okay, so Pathways of Progress is a tool that you can use with progress monitoring to determine if the student is making adequate growth or not. So in case you missed that, it's, it's if a student is making adequate growth. And so we now know what the amount of growth a kid needs to close the gap, and we also unfortunately know what, <laughs> what lack of growth widens the gap. So, because we have that knowledge now with Pathways of Progress, it's important that we be checking that to make sure, am I widening the gap for these kids or am I closing the gap? Because obviously if they're struggling, I want to be closing the gap. Is that an app? Is it a program? A Great question. So her question was, how do you, is this an app? Is it paper? How do you get Pathways of Progress? So um, Pathways of Progress as a state pay for um, kindergarten through third grade to have Pathways of Progress and you either have uh, Dibbles Net, which is through DMG, or you have M Class, which is through Amplify, um, depending on what district or charter you are in. What do you know? Amplify. Okay, so with Amplify, if you go into Progress Monitoring Graph and you, there's a little toggle at the top that you turn on, and it says Pathways of Progress. If you just turn it on, you'll see the Pathways of Progress as long as there's Progress Monitoring data in there. Because obviously, if there's no data in there, nothing's going to happen. So you do have to be Progress Monitoring to see it, um, and then. New this year to Amplify, the middle of the year report, you will see how much progress the student has actually made from beginning to middle of the year. Being knowledgeable that the progress they made from beginning to middle is likely going to be more than they make from middle to end. So kind of being mindful of that. If they're not making enough progress from beginning to middle, it's going to be even more difficult. They're going to have to really push to make that progress from middle to end. Um, so thinking of that. And I know a lot of districts have purchased Dibbles Net or Amplify so that they can have it through four, five, and sixth grade as well. So you might want to check with your literacy director or assessment director to find out what's available to you. Is there a program similar to that for and up? Just the same two, it's the same two programs, it's just as a state we don't pay for it. So um, like I know like Provo District has paid for Amplify for everyone, K6, well, four, six, because we pay K3. Um, so it kind of depends. Some districts pay for it. If you are interested in I would contact your district if you're interested in having that information, um, just kind of for your awareness and knowledge. So Dibbles Net is a dollar a student, um, Amplify is twelve dollars a student. The biggest difference between the two is um, if you're using Dibbles Net, then you have to test on paper pencil. So if you're already doing that, then it's not a big deal. Um, if you're using Amplify, then you can test on like an iPad or a laptop on a device, and so that way the scoring is automatic and you don't have to add up the scores or any of that, it's already done for you by the computer in the program. So hopefully that helps a little bit. But So when thinking about that, we want to be making sure that these kids are getting exactly what they need. And then our tier three. So tier three students who need very intensive instruction. Now, when you're thinking about this, it means they haven't responded to tier one and tier two. Okay. Now sometimes you, you already have a kid come in and you already know they are very severe. You don't have to go through tier two to get to tier three. Like if you already know, wow, we are, we are way over here. They're three grade levels behind. That's pretty intensive, right? They have a lot to catch up on. Just go straight to tier three and make sure it's very explicit. Um, this is going to be a smaller group size. It is again supplemental. So just like tier two, it's not. These kids cannot be pulled out during your 120 minutes or however long your your literacy block is. They cannot be pulled out during that time. So if they're needing interventions, it has to be at a different time. Um, it is a smaller group size, so maybe you don't have six, maybe you have a group of four or three. Um, it's increased intensity, so it is very focused and very explicit. I don't know if you've any, any of you have used like Wilson or Spire, those are very intensive interventions that you may or may not have used. 
The setting might be in the general education classroom. It, again, it might be somewhere else in the, in the school. A diagnostic assessment would be required, and we'll talk about some options for the diagnostic assessments, and more frequent progress monitoring. So these intensive kids, you would want to progress monitor every week, or at least every other week, at the very <coughs> least. Um, these kids also probably need survey level progress monitoring. Is anyone familiar with what that means? Okay. So survey level progress monitoring basically just means that you're going to progress monitor them out of grade level. Because if they are a third grader and they're reading 10 words per minute correctly, wow, they probably are really back on like kindergarten, first grade level. And so you wouldn't want to progress monitor them weekly on a third grade level because let's be real, you already know they can't do it and they know they can't do it. So that like every week that's going to be like the worst, you know, three minutes of their life. So let's just not, let's not do that to kids. And let's go ahead and progress monitor them where they actually, their instructional level is. So if their instructional level is we're working on CBC words and just, you know, phones, then great, let's go ahead and check out our nonsense word fluency. So maybe they're progress monitoring all the way back to that, and that's fine. Um, and then that myth again that I mentioned, tier three is not just for students who need special ed services. It might be those students, but it also might be a student who does not need special ed services. They're just very far behind. Oh, question. Um, we do have, and if you want, if you could write down your name and email, I can send you it. And then if you could just a note too, because by the other day I'm like, what did she say again? Um, remind me of what you needed, or you could just email me, Liz, or Mel can give you my email. Um, and send me an email, let me know that you're interested. We have, um, it's not like a recommended list, as a, as a local control state, it is best that you choose what is already available to you or um, something that your district has already, you know, maybe looked over and, and approved. Um, and we don't have, even though we have our instructional materials review every year, that's really just for core instruction. It's not for intervention. So we have a list of intervention options that we've seen often used in Utah, and it has the research linked to it. So if you are interested in what does the research say on it, or maybe not say about it, um, it would be linked to that too. So if that's something you're interested in, just let me know. Either shoot me an email or ask Mel and Liz, and they can get you what you need as well. Um, so when thinking about that, sometimes um, before we move into a student that's not responding, so one thing that um, and this might blow your mind, and that's that's okay. We blew minds last week too. Um, so when thinking about your small group time. If it is an intervention, then not everybody is getting it. So when you do small group time, some schools call it guided reading, whatever, whatever you call it, and everybody is getting it, that's not intervention. That's differentiated instruction, which is important, very important that we give to kids differentiated instruction on their level. Um, when we're doing that, that's not intervention time because everybody's getting it. Intervention time is separate from core time because differentiated instruction should be your small group time that's within your core. Because by core, I don't mean that you sat, you sat there and lectured at them for 120 minutes. Well, please don't do that, poor, poor tiny kids. Um, but, and I don't want you to think that that's what I'm telling you, because I'm not. Um, but be mindful that there are kids that need the tier two and tier three instruction. It's going to be a different small group time. It's not going to be during that time. That's differentiated instruction for every student. This is in addition to that. So being mindful of your schedule, that might be a conversation you need to have with whoever's in charge of your schedule at your school, right? Because I don't know who that is, and there's certainly no one perfect schedule that's going to work for every school, right? It just doesn't exist. Every school has different things going on and different things that they do. Um, so I know some schools do a power hour where they have kids that come out and are pulled for intervention during that hour, but other kids are obviously not because they don't need that time. So be mindful of one that some schools do it before school, some schools do intervention after school. It, Again, it completely depends on the school and what schedule works best for them and the services that their students at the school need. <coughs> so kind of thinking of that as well. Um, so before we move into students who are not responding, I'm going to give you a little bit of talk time to kind of think about and dig deep and talk to your, your colleagues about what does Tier 1 and, and look like and sound like, what does Tier 2 look like and sound like, and Tier 3, and kind of the differences between those three things um, and who gets those who's going to be giving it, what happens during that time. So just a little bit of talk time during that, and I'll be around to answer any questions if you have any during this time. Four, thank you. Um, so students who are not responding. So I know you have this handout, looks like this, 
And you'll notice that I added my own little box at the bottom. If you could add a sixth box at the bottom, we're going to add another box that we sort of thought of after the handout copies were made. And we're like, you know what? We need another box. We forgot a box. So like this. Here's my piano pad. Actually, out to be honest. You found it? Have you found it? Was it in a packet or was it separate? Separate? Okay, good to know. Because sometimes I just pull them right out so I can have my own version instead of having a big packet. Yes, if you raise your hand if you need one, Liz and Mel can, can bring you one if you don't have one. But it looks like this. Yep, yes. Oh, yes. Feel free to write if you want to color code it. I know some people have certain things that they need. Um, feel free to do that. We are sending this, and actually I think Liz already sent it, so what I'm going to have you do um, when we when we head out to lunch, I'll try to remind you, remember, can you check during lunch to make sure you got it, because if you didn't, let us know. We'll go ahead and make that work for you. But on the sheet, go ahead and draw one more box at the bottom, a sixth box, and in that box, if you could just title it materials, because materials do matter. So go ahead and add that sixth box on there. <coughs> So when you have students who are not responding, anybody have students who aren't responding? Okay, so <laughs> everyone's like, yes. Um, what you're thinking about that, some methods to, to look at increasing the intensity of instruction. So duration. So we're looking at duration, duration of the in uh, instruction, the intervention, I mean. We could just increase it by how long they're going. So maybe you have a student who isn't responding and they're only going 20 minutes two days a week. Maybe they need to go 40 minutes three days a week. Okay, so thinking about just increasing the amount of time, maybe that's what they need to be successful at this, right? They just need more time, okay? Um, the frequency, so that's kind of the number of days of the week. So like I was saying, if this student maybe, you know, is looking at we're only going maybe one day a week or two days a week to intervention, maybe we need to up that to three or four days a week. Or we're looking at the interventionist, who it is. One, are they highly trained in whatever intervention that they're providing? Two, are they there, right? Because sometimes as adults, we have personal things come out in our life where we've got to miss two weeks of work. Well, guess what? That can't mean that the kid's missing out on two weeks of intervention, right? So making sure that whoever is there is there when they're needed. Um, and also thinking about who is that? So you're, when you think of like your paraprofessionals and teachers, who is a little more highly trained to work with struggling students and interventions? Just curious. Probably a teacher, right? So if I'm a teacher, I'm going to want to be working with my most struggling kids, and maybe I can send my higher kids to an interventionist, right? So thinking about who is maybe the most highly skilled to do this. Now, if it's an intervention that you want to use with your kid and you have not been trained on it, then maybe you aren't the most, right? Like maybe. You have an interventionist who has been Spire or Wilson trained and they are amazing, great, then maybe that's the go-to. So just be mindful of that as well. The group size. So maybe just decreasing the group size. Maybe you start with six, but maybe you realize, ooh, that's not really working for Sally and Johnny. Maybe I bump them down to a group of four or a group of three. So making sure that you're making some of these accommodations to decide, ooh, this isn't working. I have to ask myself some questions about why it's not working. Skill focus, so limiting the number of skills being taught. We have all had kids that need like five different skills, right? We already know their deficits, there's five of them. But I'm gonna tell you right now, we have to kind of prioritize which ones we need to work on first. So like, if it's a student who's struggling and they have issues with accuracy and their fluency is low, and of course, inevitably, their comprehension is low, I'm gonna work on the accuracy first. Because reading really quickly, but incorrectly, doesn't really work. So I'm going to work on accuracy first because that's the most important piece. Once I have that buttoned up, then maybe I start working on the rate and the fluency. And by then, I'm hoping once our rate and fluency and our accuracy are all in place, the comprehension should be improving, right? So thinking of some of those pieces as well. So in your handout, again, I'm, I'm not going to make you use it. You're all adult learners and you know what you need. Um, but when thinking about it, you can take little notes in here. Um, hopefully you were doing that we were talking about a little bit. But that fifth box, that last, or the sixth box, sorry, it's a sixth box, is materials. So it's, it's not up here, but when thinking about those materials, you might have a limited number of tools. So um, as an example, we had 
went into the school, they said we have some sort of main students who said, well, you know, tell us one, let's talk about this one. Um, they said, okay, well, this kid, now in third grade, has been in early steps since first grade. Okay, so they did early steps. Anybody have early steps in their school? So maybe you're familiar with that intervention. Okay, they did early steps as an intervention in first grade. And then they did it in second grade. And they're still doing it now. If that intervention didn't work the first year, it's not going to work the second and third year, guys. Okay. It's the same thing if you're on a diet, right? I, I'm not going to have anyone raise their hand, but <laughs> we've probably all been on a diet at some point. So if you ever been on a diet and that first year you gained weight, are you like totally going to work the second year? No. Like you're not going to use that same diet the second year, right? So it's the same thing with an intervention. If it's not working for the kid, I, honestly, I wouldn't even wait a year. But the fact that they waited three years and the kid's on the same intervention and it still didn't work, well, of course it didn't. Right? So be mindful that if you have a small toolkit and you need to let your leadership know, hey friends, I ran out of tools. <laughs> I have used this tool with, with this kid, you know, and whatever, and, and now I'm out of tools. So you have to have a, a toolkit. It can't just be one. There's no, if there was one great intervention, guys, we would have already purchased it for you and given it to you, right? Um, so be mindful that you might have to change the materials, but making sure that whatever those materials are is matching the student needs. So we want to make sure, just like you do when you go to the doctor, if you have a broken leg, they're probably going to give you a cast, right? But we always tell people, use some kind of, you know, a uh, research-based intervention. And, and yes, we do want you to be using that. I'm going to tell you right now, those don't come from Pinterest, okay? Just throwing that out there. They do not come from teacher pay teachers. So if you could possibly use, you know, a research-based intervention, I would be ever so pleased. Um, and if you want to use Pinterest to like, decorate your home, it is lovely for that, absolutely. Or to find a Halloween costume, great. Um, <laughs> but not for intervention, not for our most struggling students, okay? We want to make sure it is solid re and in research. When we're thinking about that, if you went to the doctor, and the doctor said, I've got this amazing, right, you're the broken leg person, you go to the doctor, and they said, oh, okay, I have this amazing, it's research-based. Um, and, and yeah, yeah right. uh, can you imagine if your doctor said, I found this new surgical procedure, you'd be like, I'm going to get a second opinion over somewhere far away from you. Um, but, and they said, I'm going to give you insulin. Now, insulin, yes, research has shown that it works really well, not for a broken leg. But it's research based, well, great, but it doesn't match my needs. So making sure that whatever we're doing for kids, whatever intervention we're matching them to, actually match, matches their needs and their deficits, okay? We don't want to give every kid insulin. It's not going to work out. So being mindful of that as well. So thinking about that, thinking about the different pieces of why we would, why we would do those things, the first step before we decide what kind of intervention is, who's getting the intervention? So we have to find out who's at risk. Um, if you're in grades one through three in Utah, you are required to test on Dibbles next. So you're doing that. Um, a lot of kindergarten are also using Dibbles, but you don't have to. Um, but some districts have required it. You might be doing some student self-assessments. That's the little student self-assessment rubric to figure out, you know, are they feeling like they know what they're, what's going on? Um, this is just uh, an example assessment from like your basal series. You might be using those to inform yourself on who's at risk. Or if you're in kindergarten, you might have been using our the KEEP profile. So you may have used that as well to determine who's at risk. So first we have to find out who's at risk, right? So when you're thinking about dibbles, for example, the dibbles is the lowest level of okay. So the benchmark is the lowest level of okay. The benchmark is not, I'm suddenly perfect and proficient, right? And you've all seen kids that were green and then were not green, right? <laughs> it happens. Um, so the next thing we have to think about is when. When are we going to be doing these interventions? And I know when I was walking around, um, when we had the little discussion around MTSS, some people were, were asking when. And if I could give you like the perfect schedule that would work for every school, guys, I would give it to you. Because <laughs> uh, we're all about supporting, if you've come to any of Jennifer or I or Liz's trainings, we're all about supporting you and giving you what you need and what you ask for. Um, and there is no perfect schedule that's going to work for everybody. So that is something that has to be discussed and really has to be discussed <laughs> as a school, right? Because if it's just you saying it, it's probably not really going to get heard, right? So it has to be a whole school discussion on we need time to give kids what they need, right? They need that. It's just like when you come home from the hospital from a surgery, you need some recovery time. And does that mean you're going to go to work? Probably not, right? So there's, there's got to be something that changes, right? A difference. So thinking about when you're going to be doing that, and again, it might be in a small group, um, 
time. It might be with the interventionist. It might be after school, it might be before school. Maybe if you're <coughs> half day kindergarten, maybe the kids who are leaving for the day stay a little bit, like during lunchtime or before you guys are like, that's what we do. We're awesome. Um, or maybe the kids who are coming in, you know, for afternoon kindergarten, they come in a little bit early um, and get the extra support that they need. And then what? So what you're going to be doing, which is also very important, what are you going to be doing for these students? So in your handouts, you have, and I want you to be really mindful that the first one is kindergarten, but you'll notice it's kindergarten um, beginning of the year, and then there's a kindergarten middle of the year. So make sure you're on the right one. Obviously right now we are kindergarten beginning of the year and first grade beginning of the year. So making sure that you're turning to the right one if you just notice on the top there are various ones. Make sure we're on the right one. You'll notice in each one, do we have more? Can you just raise your hand if you're kindergarten? Raise your hand if you're first grade? Anybody who's like a coach? Okay, all right. So it looks like we were pretty good even split. So. What we're going to do is we're going to get out our Dibbles data, we're going to take a look at it, and what we're going to do is look at grouping them. So you'll notice in each section, so I'm just going to, for right now, I'm just going to pull out the kindergarten beginning of year, so we can just kind of all look at one together and look at how to read it. So if, you, if you've done this before, you can check out for a second, because some of you, have, I know I've seen you, we've done this before. But if you have not, um, feel free to ask questions if you, if you need to. So you have group one, which those are your kids that it says likely to need core support. And so it looks like their phonemic awareness, which would be for sound fluency to be in the ear, um, is at or above benchmark. So that means it's a score of 10 or more. And their Dibbles composite score, which is the most predictable, that's why it's on there, um, is at or above benchmark, which is 26 or more. So you'd be filling in those kids' names, their score on first sound fluency, and their score on their composite. When we look at group two, again, this is kindergarten and end of year. These are students who need additional support on phonemic awareness and letter sound skills. Okay. So for phonemic awareness, they have at or above benchmark, just like the first group, but their composite is below, or well below, okay? So looking at that, the next group, group three, these are kids who need additional support in phonemic awareness skills. Okay, so PA is the big one for them because their, their phonemic awareness is low. So uh, their FSF has been shown below or well below, but their composite is at or above. So they're kind of like the opposite of group two, right? So their needs are the opposite. And then we look at group four. And group four are the kids who just have a lot of needs, right? So these are your lowest kids. So they're the kids who are, their phonemic awareness is below or well below, and their composite score is below or well below. And by below or well below, like if you have Amplify, and you only have the color for the composite, just know that if they're at or above, they're green or blue. If they're below, they're red or yellow. So just, I know sometimes they don't, they don't show the actual number, so if you're getting stuck on that, you can just look at the color as well, if that helps. So that's kind of how you read it when you're looking at it. So what I want you to do is I want you to take, and I'm going to give you quite a bit of time. We'll start with 10, and if you need 15, I'll give you 15. But what I want you to do is get your class, and if you're a coach, maybe you can just get a class. Um, I want you to sort them into the four different quadrants, and again, please use the kindergarten beginning of the year and the first grade beginning of the year. Sort the kids, write in their scores, and then afterwards we're going to actually go in and talk about what group one needs instruction-wise, what group two needs, group three, and I'll give you some resources. So go ahead, pull out your Dibbles data, and let's go ahead and some students. So let's give it five more minutes for those of you that are done. Quadrants, then you've got it worked out, and then hopefully we've got what they need. So we're looking at our students. Let's look at just our group one for now. So we're only looking at our group one kids. These are only all of the kids that are likely to need core support, meaning they just need good, solid core instruction, right? So that's going to be sufficient for them. Obviously, they still get the differentiated instruction time that every student deserves. Um, and some might need to be more challenged. We might to, need to extend their learning. And so I know later today in the afternoon, we're actually going to be talking about what we can do for our highly skilled learners. Um, but know that some of the students in there might need to be challenged even further than the core support. Let's look at our group two kids. So group two, these are students who their phonemic awareness is at benchmark, which means that there's no risk, but their phonics is below benchmark, so there is some risk. So additional instruction in letter sound correspondence, and of course depending on your grade, kindergarten versus first grade, right? 
um, and blending, segmenting, or encoding those sounds, and they're going to need more practice opportunities. When you're looking at your group two students, so, and one question I ask before I move on to group, uh, group three, when we're thinking about our group ones, those are students who don't need us a lot, right? Like, they're, they're doing really well, they don't need interventions. They might need some challenging work, but they don't need an intervention time, right? When we're thinking about those students, we want to see them about one time a week, right? We don't really need to see them in a small group effort more than that. We can put them in our small groups. We can put them in our small group instruction and um, have them do, you know, one group, one with us, and then give them an activity. And we'll talk about some activities that you can give them that you can do independently um, later today. But when you're thinking about like your group two and your group three kids, so this is the group two kids that we're talking about now, but group two and group three, try to see them two to three times a week. So that's kind of your, your goal. I want to try and see them and get to their group two to three times a week. Now your, your, your level four kids or your group four kids, you want to try and get to them daily. Those are the kids that need the absolute most support from you because they're struggling in PA and in phonics. So they just have a, 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 an array of deficits that we need to fix. And so they need the most time with you. So kind of looking at how you distribute your time with, with your groups is very important to be thinking about that as well. So we're talking about our group two and what we do um, and meeting, how often we're meeting with them. Where do we start with our group two? So our group two, we start with step one, administer and analyze a diagnostic assessment. Now Dibbles is not a diagnostic assessment, it's just a screener. Right? It just tells us, ooh, something's, something's wrong, something's at risk. It's kind of like when you go to the doctor and they do like, your temperature, your weight, your blood pressure, those are all indicators of risk. And so that would tell the doctor, oh, there's some risk, but it doesn't say, oh, that person has diabetes. Right? It doesn't tell them that, it just says, oh, something's wrong. They have a fever, I don't know what the issue is. So they have to give like a strep test to find out, oh, that poor teacher has strep for the fifth time this year, because she's the kindergarten teacher. Because um, <laughs> you've all had it. Um, but we have to find out what the student knows and where the gap is. Because obviously every student knows some things, they have some strengths, just like we all do as humans, but there are some things that need a little more support. So that's what we have to find. So we're going to, after that, and I'm going to actually, in your packet, if you can page past those four swords, you'll notice that you have the Q-Pass. The Q-Pass is Q-P-A-S, it's the Quick Phonological Screening, or Awareness Screening. You have that, that is a PA, a phonological awareness um, assessment that you can be using for diagnostic needs because it digs down into exactly what is the issue. Is it word awareness? Is it sound segmenting? Is it sound blending? Where exactly is the hole? Behind that is another one that you might be familiar with. It's the core phonics survey, and that's for phonics. So that's a diagnostic that digs a little bit deeper in finding out what's really going on, where are my phonics holes. So we'll be talking about those in a moment. <laughs> but I just want to overview the steps of where to start. So with these kids, the first thing we do is administer these assessments, right? We need to find out what's really happening with these students. Now these students in group two, and I'm gonna ask for a little audience participation because it's just before lunch, and it's gonna be okay, we're gonna make it. Um, <laughs> thinking about this, your group two kids what is, the, what is something they're already at benchmark? What's, what is their, their already their strength their, that they don't need help in? A little bit louder? Okay. And then what's their deficit? Let's go back. Their phonemic awareness is at benchmark. Their phonics is below. So do I need to give them both screeners? One is for PA, one is for phonics. Yes or no? No. Which one would I give? The phonics one? Why would I give the phonics screener? Why would I give the core phonics survey instead of the QPASS for group two? That's where they're struggling, right? So I would be giving them the core phonics survey. That would be my start. I need to dig down with these kids and find out what's really happening. Now in kindergarten, it's going to be super brief because it's probably in letter names, right? <laughs> That's where we're at. In first grade, it could be a variety of things, right? Next step after I figure out where the holes are, once I've already dug in found out these are the holes, then I need to align the instruction and resources to that gap. So if I find out, ooh, it's short vowels, then I need to intervene on short vowels, right? That's where I need to make that connection. The next step would be to provide that, that intervention, that instruction that's needed in the area of need, 
for two to three days a week, right? Because we're not going to be with them all the time, right? They don't need it all the time. They're not your most severe students, but two to three days a week. So I'm going to meet with them. Now I'm also going to step four, I'm going to progress monitor them. Now these are students who would progress monitor, like I said, between, it might be once a month, it might be every other week. So two to four times a month is kind of what you're looking at for students in this area. So we have to figure out, is the intervention working? So progress monitoring just tells us, is this extra intervention that I'm doing with them, is it working? Because if it's not, I'm going to go back and ask myself those questions, and in which we took notes on that sheet where we added the sixth, the sixth box. So I have to ask myself some questions. Right? Maybe it's the frequency that I'm meeting with them. Maybe it's the duration. Maybe it's the interventionist. Maybe it's the group size. And honestly, it could just be that they don't get along with the interventionist. Have you ever had an issue where this student and interventionist just are not making best friends? Go ahead and move it, right? Like, move the kid to a new interventionist. Because honestly, fighting that all year is not worth it. These kids need help now, right? Um, so knowing that, just go ahead and make that change. So. Identifying these steps on what we need to do. Now, when you're looking at the core phonics survey, you'll notice it says for grades K through 12, because do you have to only be in K1 to have a phonics uh, deficit? No, definitely not. Um, it takes approximately 10 to 15 minutes, but that's if you give the entire thing. I'm going to tell you right now, once you find the hole, you can just stop, right? Like, oh, well, here's the first hole. This is it. I'm going to need to stop. This is where my instruction needs to be, right? Um, You'll notice it has the what the core phonics survey is about, what it assesses. Underneath that, there's a paragraph about the why we would be giving this assessment. And then after that, it says how. Then it goes into the when, so depending on what time of year it is, what grade you're teaching, what parts you could give. But kind of like I said, if you already know in kindergarten, it says for fall you give parts A and B. Absolutely. But if you're in first grade, it says give parts a through D and then E in the fall. Well, I'm going to tell you, if they're failing on parts B and C, I'm not going to go to D and E, right? Like, we prefer that, and I know you're thinking, I've never heard this from the state board, but I'm going to tell you, we prefer that you spend more time teaching than testing. I know that maybe is a mixed signal that you sometimes are getting from us, but we really do want you to be spending more time teaching and more time on instruction than you are assessing. So we're trying to differentiate when it's really needed. Like you're. Core one, your group one kids, they don't need to be progress monitored, right? That's why we didn't say progress monitor them. Like, they're good. We don't need to progress monitor, right? We don't want you to waste your time or waste their time. After that, it talks about what it means. So it actually tells you on page 43 what the benchmark is, or if they're strategic or intervention, it tells you, you know, what they need to do in order for them to, like, pass that skill, that set. And then it tells you what's next. And the next page, uh, 44, is the form where you can actually report their scores. So when you're looking at the first one, how, first of all, out of show of hands, how many of you already given this before, like in your life? Okay, maybe a quarter. All right, when you look at this, part A is letter names, uppercase letters, part B is lowercase letters, right? So in kindergarten fall, that's where we're at, right? That's probably where the deficit is. And then part C is consonant sounds. So we're looking at sounds. Part D, we have the vowel sounds, and you'll notice it's short and long, so that is combined in there. Now, if you haven't taught long vowels, are you going to test that? No, because guess what? It's probably going to say that there's a hole there. Well, of course, we haven't taught, right? <laughs> so don't give anything that you haven't taught yet, because that would be silly, right? Um, so I know first year in kindergarten when I was teaching at a, at a Title I school, which I so love teaching Title I schools, because the amount of growth you see is amazing. Um, <laughs> But I, most of my kids would come in on dibbles red, just like a whole class of red, maybe like three kids that weren't. That was my class, and a lot of my reds were zero. Anybody have any kids that scored it? Yeah, yeah, right? Um, so when you're thinking about that, do they really have a deficit, or is it because they've just never been taught? Now, if they went to preschool, you're like, oh, maybe deficit, right? If they didn't, Maybe they've just never been taught what a first sound is and what that is. And once you teach them, they're good to go, right? So be mindful that when you're grouping these kids into these four quadrants, at the beginning of your kindergarten to middle of year, there's a ton of different things that happen. So those groups have to be flexible, right? So if we're checking in and we find out, oh, my kid that was a zero, all of a sudden they're at like 30, we're good. Let's move them to number one, right? Now you're in group one. 
okay, because they really just needed to be taught. So we're trying to distinguish in kindergarten the difference of have they been taught and it's not, or, and it's a deficit, or were they just never taught? And I just need to teach it, and then they're good to go, right? So that's, that is tricky beginning of your kindergarten, absolutely, if they didn't go to, to preschool, so. And then you'll notice it moves on after that to part E, which is short vowels and CVC words, and then part F is talked about blends and short vowels. So looking at that. One caveat I want to give on this. I want you to turn and look at part G as an example. Part G is on page 47. So I know a lot of you don't have a ton of time to assess students on a diagnostic assessment. I get that, absolutely. But let me just give you a scenario. In a school where the teacher went and said, hey, paraprofessional friend, I need you to go get this assessment, train that person on how to use it, so they were highly trained, practiced with them, you know, and pretended they were the student, gave some incorrect, you know, and made sure they knew how to do it correctly, great, great, awesome, gave the assessment to a student, the assessment came back and said, ooh, there's some holes in part G. And all it was was, you know, three out of five. Okay. Does a three out of five tell you what they struggled with on that word? No. Now, you might have an indication because it says short vowels, digraphs, and trigraphs. Okay, so you might be like, oh, well, gosh, they didn't have any issues in short vowels. It looked like when it was just CBC words. But... Then when I look at this, I'm thinking, oh, maybe it's the digraphs they're talking about. So then that teacher, lovingly, provided some loving intervention on digraphs. But guess what? If the teacher had actually had a conversation with them or just given the assessment, period, without having someone else doing it, would have known that that student, it was when they're having the short vowels in the digraph or trigraph situation, they're not making the connection. And they're, they're, not, they're struggling with short vowels. So all the issues were with the short vowels the whole time, not the digraphs. So be mindful that if you're having someone else do the assessment, they've got to really know what happened and you have to have a conversation or they have to take copious notes on what happened because otherwise you won't really know what went down and you might accidentally then be wasting your time and their time giving an assessment or an intervention that really isn't based on their needs. Does that make sense, Amy? I sometimes, so when I was a school literacy coach, I was dealing with a lot of volume of core points surveys sure. uh, that I was helping teachers out with. So I would just transcribe whatever they had said over the words so there wasn't ever that confusion that sure. yep. because I couldn't even remember my notes myself once I had tested 10 or right. 12. Right. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You tested. Like, oh, what did that do? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I appreciate that. So in case you didn't hear, she was just saying that she took basically and wrote actually what the kids said instead so the teacher already knew what was really happening in that situation. So just be mindful of that. Sometimes we're obviously trying to save time, but we don't have time, and I get it. But at the same time, let's make sure we're being full and understand what's really happening with those kids during that assessment. So we're matching the intervention to their real needs. Cool. I want you to give, I want to give you just a little bit of time to read through page 41, 42, and 43, just to get an idea of why we would be using this and kind of how. Because if you've never given it before, and I just say, here you go, we're doing it, there might be some questions. So I'd like to attend to those here while you're with me. So let's go ahead and have some time to read that, and then I'll, ask, I'll have some question time after that. Questions and I totally understand if you're not comfortable posing those to the group and you want to pull me aside at lunch, that's fine. Um, but anyone who has any questions about the core phonics survey and kind of how to use it, who to use it with, when, how, what? No? Great. Excellent. Okay. So again, this is where you this is where you start. And remind me that you will get this PowerPoint, so don't feel like you have to like freak out and like, oh my gosh, I have to write this down, don't move it. Or take a picture, I mean, I understand, like, I'm a picture person. So if you want to take a picture and have that with you today, then that's fine. I understand that, too. Um, but these are the steps we would follow, right? And so this is working with your group two kids. Now, we haven't gotten to your group three and group four kids yet, right? So we talked about the core bond survey and group three. So here's what I think we're going to do. I think this is a good stopping point for lunch. I, I'm hearing some growling tummies, and I don't think it's just mine. So I think uh, we're going to take a break, and why don't we come back, it's 11.50 now, so why don't we come back at 12.50, so 
12.50 is when we're going to start, and I'm sure you noticed yesterday we do, I'm going to give them the Q-Pass. So if you turn, it's actually before the core phonics survey, if you look at the Q-Pass. So it does have uh, the first page of the frequently asked questions, kind of like why, what, um, target words. One thing I want to mention about this is it does have rhyming, because that is in the phonological awareness, you know, scope and sequence, but don't get stuck on it, right? Like, we're not getting stuck on the rhyming. It's going to be okay if that's you know where we're at, but let's not get stuck on the rhyming. Another thing I want to note it, or I want you to notice, is on. Let me see if I can find the section. Oh, section six. Sound segmentation. So, if we're looking at sound segmentation, is there any other assessment that we give already that already gathers that information? Because if there is, then we already know there's depths that we don't need to give us. So it's just like anything else. If, if, for example, Dibbles gives you something that's on here and you already know that's low, then you probably don't need to give it again because you're like, I already know that that specific skill is already low. Right? So that's that whole part of we, we don't want you to be testing all the time. We do want you to be teaching most of the time. So be mindful of that if there's something that's in there that's already tested on some other assessment that you give, maybe it's the KEEP assessment, maybe it's Dibbles, maybe it's another assessment that your district has for you, then go ahead and be like, I already have that information. I can skip that session. So be mindful of that. So what I want you to do is I want you to just take just a literally like three minutes and I want you to just read through, uh, it doesn't have a page number on it, but it is the first. <laughs> page of the queue pass that is the frequently asked questions. Read that and then if you get done early you can you're welcome to turn the page and continue on to the next section to give you some ideas of what it looks like. It does have multiple forms, so if you are aware of that, but go ahead and just take three minutes to read through that. For that, the very last page, it's actually before the core phonics survey. The very last page has on there it talks about if they have a score of zero to one, it would be red. If a score of two to three is occurring, it's a yellow, and then a four or five to be green. So it does give you the proficiency levels for those very things. So when you're thinking about that, that's on the very last page. Now, I know, I'm sure you read in there that it's, it talks about, this is talking about for kids like up to grade two, but what happens if we have PA holes for, that sounds really inappropriate, I didn't mean that, um, <laughs> awareness holes for, for students past grade level two, right? Because that's possible. And so does that mean we wouldn't give them some kind of diagnostic? No, we would still want to find out that there is a deficit there. Because what happens is oftentimes it's never checked after first grade, right? Because it's in the foundational skills for first grade and for kindergarten, it's not in there for the other grades. So then what happens is because it's no longer like tested, people are just like, yeah, whatever. But then how do we know it was really mastered, right? Question. The core phonics survey? Yeah. It tells that there's um, lessons in a teaching reading source book. Are you going to talk about that another time? Or uh, no, I can talk about that right now. So the, uh, her question was, she noticed at the end of the core phonics survey, it talks about lessons that are in the um, core teaching, te teaching reading source book. So if you've ever seen that, it is, it's like this thick of a book. And it has the big five in it and lessons that you can use for intervention purposes. Um, it is kind of pricey. You can buy it with another book. I want to say it's like 80 or $90. Um, and when you buy it with the other book, I think it's, you know, because you're getting another book, it's even more. But um, it is kind of pricey, but it is a wealth of information. A lot of times we'll use information from there. Um, but it is the TT Reading Source book. And that is where the core phonics survey comes from. It actually has. Um, companion book that comes with it that you can buy with it that has <coughs> diagnostic assessments for PA, for phonics, which that's the phonics one. Um, there's also ones for vocabulary and comprehension. In there, so it, does have it does have those other pieces if you get both books. So um, you're, you're definitely welcome. That is a great resource. We actually we call it the Bible just because it, it just has such a wealth of knowledge on all of the big five. And so for literacy, it's just really a good tool to have in your toolkit. Um, any other questions on the Q pass or the core phonics survey for that matter? Maybe thought the, uh, for lunch. Yes. Have we talked about any core form? For which one are we? Um, so it's everything that's built on that. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. So again, these are in case you came in late. We we're talking about 
the steps for additional support for group three. Now, knowing that group three, we would not be giving the core phonics survey because their need is PA, so we'd be giving the QPATH diagnostic for these students. So that would be step one, finding out where the gap is. Step two, align your instruction, because now we've already identified what those gaps are. Of course, number three, we're meeting with the same this group also about two to three times a week, um, and making sure that we're giving them their identified skill deficit area intervention. And then, of course, number four would be monitoring progress. And again, these kids are also about every two to four weeks. It depends on kind of how big their deficit is or is not on how often you would progress monitor. So we talked about the QPAS. So just kind of some reminders of that basic instructional technique. So when you introduce a phoneme, make sure you're using a picture card, right? Having some kind of picture, because PA is all done. It can be done in the dark. You've probably heard that before because you don't have to see the letters to do it. It's all based on the sounds. It's all auditory. So having students stretch it and examine it and making meaningful connections for those. Ask them to be scientists to figure out how they're making that sound with their mouth. And so that's when you're using the meters like we did yesterday. Um, so they can experiment with that. Some general guidelines identifying, of course, the precise phoneme awareness task that you want them to develop. And Again, if they have five that they're missing, let's just start with one, right? And so you'll notice that the core phonics survey starts from easiest phonics skills to more difficult. And the same thing with the Q pass. It starts with easier, it goes to more difficult. So as soon as you find the hole, you can stop giving the assessment because you already know where your instruction needs to start. Um, and engaging activities that are fun and you can play with sounds, manipulating those sounds. And be sure that the phoneme sounds are represented with those, you know, those little brackets because when you're thinking about it, it's not always the same letter that matches those sounds. So when we're, when we're representing, and then likewise, that one sound could be represented by two or three or even maybe four letters. So when you're thinking about that piece. Um, and getting that practice beforehand so they're comfortable. And then the continuous sounds, of course, are easier than stop sounds. So you're starting with more continuous sounds when you're teaching because they're easier for kids to make. And then when you're going to actually lend the words, introducing them by exaggerating them and holding them, but of course only the ones you can't because you can't exaggerate the, the sound, right? It's not like, buh, you can't do that, right? That adds the schwa and it changes the sound. So for the ones like, mm, you can hold that for a long time. So you can, the ones that you can hold, hold. The ones that you can't, it talks about rapid repetition. One little note about rapid repetition is sometimes when we're there we go. When we're teaching sounds to students, um, sometimes you'll hear people say, you know, they have a whole routine. They're like, oh, this is, this is the letter, you know, B, and B always says, and and great. And then they'll say, but then they have a little like thing that goes with it, a routine that's like B says, but does B make all of those books or just one? Yeah. So like your struggling kids, like your higher kids, got it. I understand what you're doing here, friend. I uh, I'm on it. Well, your struggling kids are going to think that when they go to blend and sound out, they're like, buh, 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 buh. <laughs> and you're like, oh, oh no, just once. That's on me. <laughs> so be mindful that some kids might not understand the distinction of what you're trying to do versus what the sound actually should be. Um, identifying, of course, initial we know is easier versus final, and then medial is the most difficult. So making sure that you're flowing in that same mode that we talked about yesterday. And of course, starting with something a little bit easier and moving into more difficult. A VC pattern is much easier than a CVC pattern word when you're thinking about those things. And then our group four. So our group four students, these are your students that are the most significant needed, right? Like they have a lot of things going on. They have PA and they have phonics. So if they have PA and phonics holes, are we going to give them one of these, both of these, none of these? What do you think? Both. We would be giving them the Q pass and the core phonics surveys. So group four is getting two. Q pass and core phonics survey. They're getting both diagnostic assessments because they have holes in both areas. And so that's why we have to determine what those holes are in both areas. So step one is administer and analyze the diagnostic assessments. And again, it's just that little reminder. It's both phonological and phonics. They have holes in both. Two, align instructional resources to their skill gaps because obviously there's more than one provide that intervention. It says two to three days a week. Now remember we talked about how you can start with two to three days a week, but if you find out, oh, that's not enough time for them, I have to do it four days a week or five days a week, then go ahead and do that. More than likely, these are your kids that really already need four or five days a week. 
I'll tell you that now. They are the most severe. They are going to need a lot of support. And so you might want to start with three days and see how it's going. And if they're not improving at the rate that you're hoping, boost it up to four and five days. But these are the group of kids that you are going to be with the most. And then monitor progress is for, with formative assessment. And of course, these are students you're going to want to monitor progress every week or at least every other week. And that's what we talked about, that survey level assessment, trying to figure out, oh, OK, I'm going to have to monitor out of grade level to find out where they're really, are they really making progress on what I'm actually teaching them. So here's some biological awareness resources. Now, I'll tell you in the PowerPoint, if they can be hyperlinked, if it's like an online resource, we hyperlink them. So you can just click on the picture and you already have access then of where to find that. So this is Road to the Co- Anyone have that book? A couple people have that book? Yep, so Road to the Code is one that uh, really great for phonological awareness activities. You can also use the Phonemic Awareness in Young Children book by Marilyn Nader Adams. She's kind of like the guru on PA. Um, that's another great book. Sounds in Action is also a book. I don't think it's very expensive. Actually, none of those books are super expensive. Um, this one is an online resource that you can use. And then how many of you have used the Florida Center for Reading Research? Oh, yay, I'm so glad, because the FCRR, the Florida Center for Reading Research, is such a great tool, and they have just a ton of information on there for you. Great resource for you, and it is free. So I definitely recommend using that for your PA resources. Any other PA resources that you have in your toolkit that you'd like to share with others, that you have used and it works really well? <laughs> well, it works well for testing, but not for no, the, the interventions. Oh, though, that's only on Amplify. Oh. So that's, yeah, so that's... So on, on Amplify, they have the what, what's next tools, but my understanding is those are only supposed to be used for like the first six weeks of school, and then they're kind of not. That's what, so that's what I was told. I, I'm not 100% sure on that because I don't work for their company. Oh, Liz, do you know? I just went to a training last week with Amplify. Thank you. Tell us more, please, Liz. And I'm going to give you the microphone. So when you click on the what's next, have, it's only good for about four to five weeks after the MOI assessment, the, or BOI, the beginning of the year. And then, once you have your MOI assessment administered, then they're valid again for about another month or so. So they're not valid for eight, ten weeks, because obviously your students' needs, is, needs have changed since they were administered that first assessment. But that's not to say that you can't go in and look at next steps and maybe Johnny needed this activity or skill and then you realize four weeks on the road, oh, Susie could benefit from this. So it's a great place to gather, it's not just UFC, <laughs> it's a great place to gather suggestions and activities and ideas that you can use with other students as well. Um, but they have an amazing amount of activities that you can't possibly get through even if it's listed that, so I just ran all of them off and then you have them there and it'll list what you would use them for. So it's kind of nice to have all of those in one binder, a hard copy, and you can just go through which ones will help. Yes, so and it, like you said, it is a great resource to use, but you need to take your other formative assessments that you've been doing and use your good teacher judgment to apply which activities would work best with which students. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Oh, yes, question. PALS, mm -hmm. yep, and you might use, um, PALS is like first grade, no, K-PALS is kindergarten PALS, um, but PALS is a good one that people have used in the past that works really well for students. Um, and you have the ERI kit that you, yes, yes, that works very well for kindergarten students if you have kindergarten. It's really only for kindergarten, but it works amazingly well at kindergarten. All right, so for phonics resources, so we have the 95% group. Does anyone have the 95% group intervention system in there? Yes, yes, okay, so a couple people do. So that is always an option. They're very explicit, and there is a, a lot of them. Um, but that's something you can use. Otherwise, when you click on this resource right here, the Raleigh County one in West Virginia, that one is actually created by the same people as the 95% group before they realized that they could probably make this into an actual program. So be mindful of that. You can go on here, and it does have some of the phonics lessons already explicitly built out for you. And that would be a great resource because it is free. The 95% group, once you get to this level, it does cost you some money. And then I know some of you were asking yesterday, how do we get to that situation where um, we, when we're looking at the phonics 
lesson that Liz was showing, and it has the sounds, the phonemes, and then it has the words, the phrases, the sentences, and then the story, the text with it. So that is here. So when you click on the, this is the Canyon School District Decodable Database, and I'll show you, we'll go there for just a quick moment. Of course. Okay, never mind. I can't go there. Because I don't have internet access. Our firewall tends to block a lot of uh, district websites or uh, district internet services. So I apologize, I cannot show you. Um, but so if you just click on it, you can go there and that it has pages and pages and pages of here's the, um, the phoneme and then it goes into the words and then the phrases, the sentences, and then the text. And remembering that the words, phrases, and sentences are all from that text. So that's where you can find that as well. And on the back, the very last page of your handout, you have the Xeno word list. So it's that's the actual word list, but then the other side of the page actually has the instructions on how you would use it. So the Xeno's word list, I'm sure a lot of you use like the Fry word list or the Dolch word list, and, and absolutely those are options, but the Xeno word list is the 107 most frequent words found in text. And so when you're thinking about that, that's where we're coming from, those 107. Why you would use this? Well, you could study some of your students' word identification strategies to figure out well, what are they even doing? Do they have some kind of word attack strategies when they're looking at that? And structural analysis and functions. And to inform and classify the students' word recognition ability, like what level are they at grade level, below grade level? And then to assess the extent of the students' sight word vocabulary or high frequency words. So when you're looking at that, if you look at that page on the back side of it, or front side of it, I should say, it tells you why, so you can look at first, second, and third, some reasons why. It talks about how to administer the word list, and then talks about mastery of grades. So I know sometimes when we see things in education, level A, level B, level C, we think that they're associated with guided reading levels. These ones are not. So just kind of letting you know on that that these words are not like associated, like all the B words are only in the B books. It's not, that's not associated. So in, for kindergarten, at the end of kindergarten, students should have mastered level C, which then if you turn to the back page, you'll notice A through C is that top group. So that would be expected to be mastered by the end of kindergarten. And then when you turn back, it says for first grade, it doesn't have trimester, so it would be like D, E, and then F would be at the end of your first grade. So that very, all of those then would be mastered by the end of grade one. Were you able to get it? Okay, we're going to switch over so we can show you how to get to the canyon thing um, so that you have access to that. Just one moment. friends we still kind of do it it was a really good try though <laughs> so when you're looking at it it'll say the canyon school district decodable database and that's where you can have more access to decodables if you don't have very many you were able to get it excellent thank you um, so like I said our firewalls tend to uh, um, block a lot of a lot of scary webs like that so that's fine um, but when you're thinking about that, the other page it will say game sheets. So they call them game sheets, but they're not really game sheets. It's just a sheet that you saw yesterday that had the different pieces on it. But they call them game sheets because if you call it a game sheet, the kids want to do it. Okay. So it gives them a little bit of motivation, even though it's not a game. <laughs> All right. So when you're teaching sight words, and I know Liz talked you through kind of that piece yesterday. When we're providing visual supports for new words through pictures, objects, and actions, if you can. Now I understand for some 
words, that's not really going to work out because I don't know what picture you use for the or action, right? So be mindful that if you can't, you can't, but if you can, it would be great. So give students the opportunity to hear new words in context and ask questions about what they mean, why we use them. Does anyone have any students who are reading and they kind of blow through the high frequency words or the sight words? Yeah, so they do have meaning, right? Like we're blowing through the word he, and it's a, a name that can be, you know, he or she, which I think today is like every name. Um, but making sure that that is important. We need to know what's really happening. So those little words, even though they're small, they might only be two letters, they are important. Connecting the oral and written forms of the new words. So when you're teaching it orally and you're showing them, making sure they're having, they have some time to actually write those as well. And then have them use those new words in a sentence on their own. Another way you can do it after, because we gave you some ideas yesterday, so I'm just giving you a few more ideas for high frequency words. I know Liz yesterday talked about how they're, we're really looking at when you're teaching sight words, we're really just teaching the ones that are irregular. So like the and was. We're not really teaching can. Like, I'm not going to spend a lot of time teaching can because I'm going to spend a lot of time teaching phonics. <laughs> and you can sound out the word can without teaching it as a sight word, right? So um, spending time with that and then thinking about when you're teaching the word the, the th sound, that is, that is regular in that word. It's the e that's not really you know, doing the right thing, making the right sound. So teaching them, so at least they can have some clue as to when they get to that word to not go t, right? If they're knowing the th, that's going to be really helpful for them. So if you can make those connections to like the word said, the s and the d do make that sound, it's the ai that's kind of not making the right sound. So if you can give them the regular parts of that word to help them at least make that connection, it might be really helpful for them. So this is an option. You can do personal readers. So this is just a notebook where basically they look at text or poems or passages that they're already fluent at reading and you basically just cut them out and glue them in there so that when they have some independent reading time, they can be doing repeated readings on things that you already know they are fluent on. So it's not going to stump them up, they're not going to be stuck or looking at a word that, they, that you would think, oh, they might not know that word, so then they're going to read it six times and find out, oh, They've been reading it wrong the whole time, so now that's kind of cemented in their mind. So that's an option. Sure. So I, I can't show you an example. Um, so it's just a notebook, just like a basic notebook that you take notes in. And if they're really fluent at a poem that you've been working on maybe in class, then you have that printed out, cut it out and glue it in there. So you already know that they've had work with you in class, you've scaffolded it for them, you now know that they are on an independent level with that and they can read on their own without you. And then their independent reading time is a go-to for them. So this could be class books that you've maybe already created in class. I'm sure some of you are doing that, so it's something that you've read, the whole class created it and you've read it several times and now you're just going through and letting them have some more repeated reading practice with it. Does that help? And then the structural scaffolding. So sometimes when we put pictures, we're like, why did I put that picture? It's supposed to remind me of something, and then I don't remember. Oh, yes. Providing time for students to read um, at an instructional level, because that's when you're giving them the scaffolding. So when it's on their independent level, they don't need you, right? So if we're, on an, you know, if we're doing a small group activity, and I'm giving them something on an independent level, that's really not worthwhile, because they don't need me to be there to scaffold it. So making sure that we're getting them into that instructional scaffolding, which is harder, right? It's going to be a little bit more difficult for them to read. They couldn't do it on their own individually. Making sure they're getting that time into that to challenge them and push them a little bit further. And then rereading, of course. Repeated reading is such a big deal. Like I said earlier, um, repeated reading on things three to four times. I know it's, it's, even if you think of it as for adults, have you ever read a book? And then you read it a second time because it was so great, you're like, I totally did not remember that chapter the first time. How did I miss that? Um, or certain pieces of the character, certain aspects that you're like, I didn't really pick up on that the first time I read it. So it's the same thing. So getting that repeated reading and thinking about, okay, now I've got some repeated reading, giving them some activities to do with that so that they can have a written response or a prompt, and then they can write a written response or some kind of activity that goes with it. So we're going to take a quick break. We have time for 15 minutes. I was thinking it'd be only 10, but we can do 15 minutes. So it's pretty much 1.20, so let's come back at 1.35, and then we're gonna dive into high ability learners, and then we'll end the day with school setting. So come on back at 1.35.
All right. Let's go ahead and get started on high ability learners. Anybody have any of these kids in your classroom? Just a couple? Okay. So what we're thinking about, who are your high ability learners? Okay, so one, if we're thinking of high ability, high ability learners, these are like your kids that are blue on dimples. Okay, that's blue. Now, not to be confused with high ability learners and gifted, gifted. Okay, so gifted is really only two to five percent of the population. It's like it's just like so when you're thinking about that, I know sometimes I've walked into schools and they're like, oh, my kids are gifted. I'm like, that seems unlikely that the whole population is in more room. Um, <laughs> so thinking about that, these are your blue kids. They're not necessarily gifted, but they are, they do deserve to be challenged. And all kids, no matter whether they're low, medium, or high, they all deserve to grow at least a year within a school year. Right? We still need to challenge them and grow them as much as we can. Even though they're already proficient, we still need to have them have some growing. So it's based on your students' changing needs, because as you know, the kids you get in at the end of the year are not the same kids that you have in the middle of the year or the end of the year. And it does require some ongoing formative assessment. You do have at least the the blue, so you know oh, these kids are well, or above, well and above, and you need to have some more complex tasks for them. And when you're thinking about data collection and use, it's not like you're going to progress mom for these kids, but you do need to have some kind of formative assessment for the tasks that you're giving them. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, to make sure that they are still, you know, intrigued and motivated and they are moving. And then creating fluid groups and groups, some of them might even remain together the whole year, right? Maybe they're all just kind of growing together and that's okay as well. So there's really just type, three types of different extension opportunities. So it could be differentiation. You might be looking at enrichment and you might be looking at acceleration. So when we're thinking about those. I'm going to dive into each of those a little bit more, but all of the ideas I give you are from the UPA's Gifted and Talented Handbook. I don't know if any of you have had that. Maybe you have it in your district or your building or something, but that's kind of where a lot of these, not all of them, some of them we did link uh, because they're not in there, but just know that a lot of them are from this handbook that is put out by the state. So when we look at differentiation, I know we talked a little bit about differentiation, how everybody gets differentiation in their core one. Uh, when thinking about that, it's, it's tailoring their instructional practices to create you know, a different kind of something for them. So. In our high ability readers, there's four areas, and we'll talk about these four areas um, in depth on each one, but there's content, there's the process, there's the product, and the learning environment. So the content is what you're going to be doing. That's a pretty easy pull. You can pull from like science and social studies, right? You already have some other content areas that you could develop even further. The process is how that's going to happen, so we'll talk about that. And the, the product is, at the end, what are, they, what are they going to give to you? Is it going to be a research project? Is it a painting? What? What is going to be the end product? And then the learning environment, where is this taking place? So some things to be thinking about when we're differentiating. So in general ways, an independent study of, of topic of interest, and you're thinking, can, kinder, can kindergarten and first grade students do this? They can. They can, especially your really high kids, they can do a lot of ama amazing things all on their own. They actually usually have more independence, you've probably noticed this, than some other students in your class might possibly have. But making sure that this, whatever the content that you're putting them in, give them a choice, right? If you say, okay, everyone in my high group, we're all gonna talk about, you know, hot air balloons. Maybe some kids, just that's not motivating for them. They, they're not going to be deeply involved as some other kids. So be thinking about it's something that has to be relevant and connected to their lives and something that's gonna motivate them to go far and above. So when you're thinking about that, if, if we're giving them actual tasks that is going to really cognitively put a load on them, and this is, these are kids, and you'll notice this, that not always have that cognitive load put on them. So to see that struggle, they may not be used to that struggle if everything else has kind of come easy to them. So we have to really you know, talk to them about how you can persevere and work past that. And so you're working on some other um, skill areas as well when you're doing these pieces. But making sure it's meaningful problems and we're looking at those high levels and making it as complex and abstract as, as we can, but also not so much that they shut down, right? So we are pushing, but not pushing too much. So what can be differentiated? The goals of the lesson can be differentiated. The outcomes required of a student, because it might all be on the same topic and a general idea, but the process might be different, and so the outcomes are going to be different depending on your high-level learners versus your average student. The activities and projects in which they engage in and the strategies that you employ as an educator. You might be asking more uh, DOK 3 and 4 questions with those kids than you are with maybe the rest of the class because maybe if they're used to being asked that, they're going to get better and better and 
persevere through the struggle, the cognitive struggle that that takes to answer those kinds of questions. The materials that you're using might be different. You might giving, be giving them more complex test, text, but it might be on the same information that you're giving the other kids. It's just on a higher, more complex level. And then the assessment to measure their progress, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So where to start? We'll begin with your core standards, and I don't just mean for ELA. So when you're looking at that, you're identifying potential themes and ideas and generalizations that can be used for kind of ultra, overarching co concepts. So for an example, like respect could be one. When you're thinking about respect, that can go across content levels, right? And it can be a theme that you're working on in a more cognitive manner. And then shaping the goals and outcomes and activities, strategies, materials, all those things that you're using. Um, and making sure that all of those pieces, not just one, but all of those pieces are responsive to your higher ability students. So when we're changing those pieces, we have to think about the so the complex and challenging subject matter, it requires real struggle. Okay, so intellectually, we need to be pushing students. Utilizing the primary documents, my primary documents, when you think of, so for like a higher level, when we look at like the Constitution, it is not really written in the same language that we're used to really thinking about and reading, you know? So if we're thinking about that, that's a primary document that kids may not normally have access to, even though they can. And so um, I'm not saying use that with a kindergartner, right? <laughs> like, that would be probably more of a higher level. But those primary documents that maybe they haven't seen before, it might even be written in, you know, a different, it might seem like a different language, like Old English sounds a little bit different when you're reading it. Um, and integrating research skills and methods on um, whatever basis you have them using that, but that's for the content. And then incorporating, again, relevant real life experiences. Okay? Um, and then interdisciplinary connections. So when you're thinking about the process, so now you've chosen whatever that content is, you've chosen a content. But when we're looking at the process you're going through, we have to emphasize those higher order level skills. Now I know a lot of us are familiar with DOK. Anybody have training on DOK? A few people? Okay. So if you have a little touch on it briefly today, some kind of um, a rule of thumb for those. I know some of us um, have had DOK training where it's, it's all about the verbs, but that's really a myth. It's not all about the verbs because some of those verbs can be used in a higher level and some of them not so much higher level. And some of you are laughing because you're like, I have been through the verb training. Um, emphasizing the higher order skills in problem solving and communication. You'll notice in our core standards, and this is, um, I'm always surprised when people are like, you know, I don't want the Common Core. I'm like, well, then you tell me you teach the Common Core. It's just the you, know, you talk more standards. Um, but knowing that it does require, we are asking kids to be thinking at a higher cognitive level. So asking them to have those ideas. And I'm sure you're thinking of some adults that you're like, I sort of wish they would have had some of that in their <laughs> schooling uh, as they're coming up. But thinking about those problem solving skills that we're wanting kids. And I know a lot of you are looking, thinking of probably the math when you're thinking of the math um, standards, how those are listed out, the additional pieces, like one of them is about persevering. So thinking about that, those other pieces are included in there. They may not be stated in exactly like math, blah, 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 one, but they are in there. Fostering self-initiated, self-directed learning, because these are the kids you're only gonna meet with once a week, right? So once a week, you have to give them what they're going to be doing, right? And then they're going to be working independently on their own throughout that week, or maybe even multiple weeks, depending on the timeline on that project. So you have to give them that, that one time where you're giving them, this is what we're doing, this is how we're going to do it, but then it's you know, kind of on their own. They can, they can be involved in that process, right? I think having them involved in what the timeline looks like, they can choose their own timeline. Maybe they want to work on it for a week. Maybe they want to work on it for two weeks. Um, and promoting creative applications and ideas. And then, of course, modeling rich academic instruction. So that's where that oral language comes in. Then we started the day with that Meaningful Differences video and bringing in that academic language so they're using those higher level skills and vocabulary. So as far as the product goes, and we talked about self-directed learning a little bit, they need to have meaningful collaboration. So if they're doing this all on their own, someone has to be collaborating with them. So if you're thinking that maybe I could send that with the paraprofessional, the paraprofessional is the one collaborating with them, maybe it's you as the teacher that once a week when you're meeting with them, maybe it's the group of kids that they're working on, maybe it's a group project, it's not just an individual project that they're working on, um, and having those complex issues and effective communication. So if they don't have that effective communication, 
they're probably not going to be as involved in it, and we want them to be having that communication. That, that discussion is so important for kids because it's not just us asking questions, it's them asking questions as well. So they should be able to ask not only questions to us, but questions to other students when students are speaking. And then the social emotional understanding of, of course, the community, the culture, and that physical environment that we don't often get to dig into. You'll notice we don't have social emotional standards. In our, we have, you know, a couple in social studies and then a couple in health, but we don't have, this is our list of every grade level in our state, and these are the social emotional skills that they'll be working on. We don't have those. And then the learning environment. What, what is the physical setting that this is going to be happening in? Because maybe it's outside the classroom. Maybe it's even outside the building, right? If they're doing some kind of science experiment, maybe that's going to be happening outside of the building. So changing the actual place the students are working and allowing for flexible time like I said, involving them in the timeline, if this is going to be a two-day activity or a week-long or maybe a two-week-long activity, and then providing opportunities for independent study and in-depth research. So I'm going to give you examples of some of these. So this is, how many of you have read Where the Wild Things Are? It's fairly common, I think, probably most of you. Um, so we have some thinking skills, discriminating between similarities and differences, discriminating between real and fantasy, because as we all know, tiny children aren't always aware of that because let's let's be real, we lie to them and say the tooth fairy is coming. So I mean, and Santa's real. Like, so I mean, you know, we sort of put some of that in there. But and then determining the relevancy for them. So a group discussion and learning task, this is an example. Complete a Venn diagram that compares how Max is different before and after visiting the wild things. So we probably wouldn't have everybody doing that. Maybe everyone in your class can do that, and if so, great. And then we move on a little bit deeper, but that's an example. Fold the paper in half on one side, draw things to tell a story that could be real, and then the other thing is some things in the story that would not be real, that are fantasy. And you'll notice it says draw things, because we know some kindergartners can't quite write those things. So if they're drawing the things that are real in a fantasy, that's fine. If they can write them, even better, right? And we're hoping that your kids that are a little bit higher level are already have some of those skills involved. And then discuss the value of imagination for children and for adults. What is the value of that? As you all know, I'm sure as adults, some of you probably only read fiction in your spare time, right? Fiction is kind of where you live. And when we think of some of the most, um, like the New York Times bestsellers, uh, like Twilight, for example, that's, you know, not exactly non fiction, right? So I mean, when we're thinking about some of those bestsellers, even as adults, that imagination is great for us, too. The Mysteries of Harris Burdick. Has anyone seen the book? It's, it, you might be familiar with it if you're, um, it's only pictures, and so they're, it's, very, it's a very interesting book. Um, but some of the thinking skills, they'd be identifying characters, identifying the pattern, determining cause and effect, which in kindergarten and first grade is definitely going to be higher level for them, um, and judging with criteria. So some kind of criteria to judge, is this really art? Why, why do you think this is art? How, why don't I think this is art? Um, <laughs> And then the group discussion learning test. So what attributes do all the pictures have in common? And that's going to be really high for kindergarten and first graders, right? So we're pushing them. Illustrate or explain one pattern you identify in this book. Identify several cause and effect relationships inferred in this book. So we all know inferring is, is a higher level order all on its own. And then as a group, brainstorm and list criteria for judging a piece of literature as a classic. That would be really difficult at this grade level. So you have some kids that can do that, great. If we don't, that's okay, it can be second enough. Um, and then individually write an editorial declaring whether or not this book would be valued as a classic in future generations. Again, probably a little bit too high. So you'll notice when we give you these examples and these activities, we start a little bit easier, a little bit lower, and then we build off of those because you can always be pushing kids to where their, their limit is. Character. So this is another one where you'll notice when we start at the top, it's a little bit easier. Who is the main character? That's the DOK1 question, right? And then eventually getting down to DOK4. So write two to three sentences describing the character, so it's getting a little bit more difficult. Demonstrate how the character uses blank in the story. So it could be uses perseverance or you know that sort of thing, uses strength. Um, list three traits and explain how the main character exhibits these traits in the story. It's going a little bit higher. Hypothesize what happens to the character after the story ends. So they're having to almost make up another ending. <coughs> Excuse me. Explain your predictions by relating it to the character's traits and actions in the original story. So they're having to go back in that text and pull things, some facts from that text, to actually be using with, the, with their descriptions. 
And then evaluate the main characters and provide evidence of who were the cleverest, funniest, bravest, or most and least likable characters in the story, and why. So again, pulling back in that, let's look in the text, let's get some facts, and then why you would be backing that up, instead of just, this is what I thought. Right? Because a lot of kindergartners say, I like blah, blah, blah. And then that's kind of where we're at. <laughs> so pushing them higher. You'll notice that none of these things are probably mind-blowing to you. These are just things that you would probably start with your whole class. And if the whole class can do them, eventually you're noticing where the whole class cannot do, where their level stops. And then that's where you're pushing your kids. So it's a similar concept and activity, but you're pushing them further with more complex questioning. So the complex question kind of comes into play if you um, have any colleagues that are teaching in the grades that are tested by SAGE. Sometimes they'll say, well, my kids are really great. They're super high on dibbles. They're not doing well on SAGE. That's where the questioning comes in. So SAGE has higher level questioning skills, and if kids don't have practice in that, they're not going to do well on that. So you might have, this will be influencing our later grades, right? Because I'm going to tell you guys, you guys are crazy important. K-1, that's where it's at. So <laughs> in case no one's telling you that lately, you guys are incredibly important. Assessment options for these students. So your high ability le learners, they need to have some kind of opportunity to document that they were, they did master this. And this might be competency-based. If you, is anybody doing competency-based in their districts uh, at this age? Not yet. Some of them, okay. So it could just be a simple pre-test, post-test, right? It's pretty common, we've seen that before. It might be a self-assessment. Maybe they're reflecting on their own work and their own process and thinking about, how did I do? And you'd have to give them some kind of rubric probably, and they could be included in creating that rubric that would be a higher level skill as well. But thinking about they're reflecting on themselves and adjusting, oh gosh, well I, I probably could have spent more time on this, or I could have done this differently, and that would have had a different outcome, or I could have, you know, whatever. Um, creating goal-based checklists, that's something you could do with them, and a checklist would be really easy for, for tiny children. And then conferencing commentary or qualitative feedback, and this, again, it doesn't have to be with you. This could be with a student, this could be with their group, this could be with a paraprofessional, this could even be with a paravolunteer. So thinking about how you can pull in other adults when you are the only one and you know I'm probably only going to meet with these kids about once a week. So it's your turn. Be thinking about some ideas. It could be a lesson that you have coming up in the near future or maybe a month or two out. But thinking about how you can push, not through just content, but also the process and the assessment, how you can push those students and figuring out what can I do a little bit higher level, and I want you to work with this in a group. So unless you are like, no, I'm done with my group work, and that's fine too. But pushing through and deciding what can I do to push this task and this content just a little bit further, and their more complex thinking skills, to get them really on that, having that cognitive demand that honestly our low, low level kids, they have this kind of cognitive demand put on them every day. Right? So we're just putting it on everybody else as well. So go ahead, I'm gonna give you some time to think about that.
the mental process behind that. And then strategic thinking requires more reasoning. Again, reasoning for kindergarten and first graders doesn't really exist. And so if you if you have any had if any of you have your own personal toddler at home right now, you are already aware of this skill not being there. Um, and extending their thinking. So it requires some kind of complex thinking and problem solving and it could be an investigation or planning and developing something, um, those kinds of things. So kind of some general rules of thumb to be thinking about. If there's only one correct answer, it's probably a DOK 1 or 2. So it's a pretty low level question. It doesn't take a ton of rigor. So DOK 1, you either know it or you can recall it or locate it or you don't know it. DOK 2 is a little bit more conceptual when you're thinking of applying one concept and then you're making a decision before applying the second concept. So it's looking at two different pieces and then explaining your thinking. But if it's more than one solution or approach and it requires evidence, it's probably going to be DOK 3 or 4. And this is where the SAGE questions come in. And that's why when people are like, it was really hard. Um, yeah, it is. it is. We are requiring kids to have that more, more problem solving, more cognitive rigor, and that is included in the SAGE assessment. So the DOK 3 must provide supporting evidence and reasoning of why. So not just how, but why. So they have to justify their response. Something we don't do often in K1. Um, DOK 4 is all of the, those first three, and they're using them from multiple sources or texts. And when you think of text, a text could be a picture, a text could be a video, it could be an audio clip, um, it could be an actual text, obviously. But those other pieces are also text, when you're thinking of text. And then problem solving. So when you think about this, and I know a lot of people think problem solving, they think math or problem solving, they think science and doing some kind of investigation, a hypothesis and getting to where they need to solve the problem, or even engineering. So when you're thinking of like the STEM schools, this might be a little more uh, prevalent in their schools, but the mental process that involves for identifying, and not just identifying, but defining the problem, employing some kind of solution finding activity, it could be an inv investigation, it could be building something, it could be a variety of things. Articulating that final solution to overcome any obstacles or barriers that they found while getting to the end of the actual problem and solving it. And the opportunity to experience authentic hands-on learning, so that's a big piece. That might be one that you're going to have to set up, right? So remembering, of course, if this is going to take you like three weeks to set up and the kid's going to be doing this for one day, maybe don't pick that activity. I'm just saying, you guys already have a ton of stuff that I know all of you are doing on weekends. When I drive by this, the school that's close to my house, there's at least seven cars there every single Saturday. So I know you guys are doing a ton of work on your own time, and um, I so appreciate everything you do for kids. Um, and then making sure that that subject or idea is important to them. So if you're going to give them an individual task or a group task and it's not important to them, they're probably not going to persevere or keep doing it, right? So they have to have some kind of motivation and wanting to figure that problem out. Their research skills. So the topic selection should be based on the student's interest in, and ability, and then it needs to be narrow. Because if you ask a kindergarten or first grade student, what do you want to do, a research topic? They're going to be like, dogs. Mm -hmm. Cool. What about dogs? <laughs> so you're going to have to ask a lot of why and what abouts before you get to a more narrow focus that's really appropriate. Because maybe when they're just thinking about dogs, it's like, well, maybe can we talk about a breed? And then maybe something special about that breed, like what are their specific behavioral characteristics of that breed? So it has to be a lot, a lot more narrowed down because if you've ever done a research project on just dogs, that's going to take a really long time because there's, the focus isn't narrowed enough. So narrowing the focus for them is something you're going to have to help them with. Um, and then encourage them to choose topics that are more rigorous. So you are having you know, to push them a little bit further. It might be something that they're not quite comfortable with at first, but making sure they at least have the motivation on the general topic itself. So some other ideas. Um, this is a little bit, this wouldn't be appropriate for K1. I'm just throwing it out there, but um, you could use StoryRobe. It's an app. Anybody have StoryRobe as an app on there? Anyone? No? Okay. So StoryRobe is an app for digital storytelling. So the kids have the story and then they can actually upload like their own illustrations and stuff to make their own um, book. And then the read dog of the exquisite corpse is what it's called. So that's why I said it's not appropriate for K1. We're talking about a corpse. But it's an old game in which people write down a phrase on a sheet of paper. They fold it over to conceal part of it. Not all of it, just part of it. And then they pass it on to the next player to the same. And the game ends when someone finishes the story, which is then a read aloud. 
So when you're thinking of that, it could start with some of the rest of your classmates, but then be finished right, with some of your other students, some of your high ability learners. But it's pretty exciting because your, the turn and where the stories are going to go with each kid they pass it to is going to be probably, and honestly, let's be real, in K-1 it's going to be hilarious because they have like the funniest ideas when they're thinking of things. So before they're doing this though, making sure they're talking about it. So if we want kids to write about something, they have to have time to talk about it. And it might be again with you, with, an, uh, with another adult, but having that time is important. So now it's your turn. So I want you to be thinking about, we, we've talked about some examples. I know you had some think time earlier today that kind of think about different ideas in an upcoming lesson. But I want you to kind of be thinking about how can you bring this back to your teammates? Because clearly all of you are not the only ones in your school probably that have some high ability learners. So thinking about how you can be bringing this back to your teammates and what are some ideas that maybe you can even do as a whole grade level. Like, hey, we're all going to work on this one thing for our high ability learners and maybe they just all happen to have interest in this one thing. Great. Wonderful. Then you don't all have to do it separately on your own. Um, or maybe you can have a high ability learner group and maybe it goes across your um, teachers, across the near grade span. Um, and maybe even across grade level. So it could be a project, certain parts of it are just for the kindergartners. And then another part that's going to be more complex is for the first graders. And, so thinking about those pieces, and I want you to have a brief discussion, just two minutes with the person next to you, on how you can bring this back to your team members that weren't able to come today. cognitive rigor that we aren't probably giving kids all the time. We give it sometimes, right? But we're going to be giving it more often to the students who are in this group. So reading at school and at home. So um, Jen is, I wish Jen was here today because she is super passionate about, about this. This is the whole um, reading 20 minutes at home kind of deal. And so when you're thinking about this, we want to make sure that when we are having kids read, whether this is at school or at home, we're giving them a wide range of books and text. And again, text could be print, it could be digital, it could be, um, I can't think of what it's called. Material. 
audio, thank you. I like how you guys were like, I see what she's doing with the headphones, right? Um, <laughs> yes, it could be. It could be audio text, and honestly, even your students who they really want to read a book, but it is well above their level, if you give them an audio book on it, they will do their best to follow along and read it, and it will actually be a scaffold for them. So I know we use that a lot in middle school and high school, but you can even do it for little kids who are like, I want to read that book that everybody else can't like that. So thinking about that, but this includes storybooks, this includes poetry, all those pieces. So giving them a wide range of reading materials. Another thing we want to think about, oh, and that includes classmate books. So if you do have those classmate books, include those as well. Um, but we want to make sure that, that it's related to their general interests. So we want to give them their choice, right? And, what they, and I know sometimes as teachers will, but you need to read the books in this bin. But maybe the books in this bin, maybe there's only five of them in this bin, and they just don't have any interest in any of those topics. So making sure we're finding those topics to help them build that interest on their not only their background knowledge, but their cultural experiences, because we do have a diverse group of students and we want to make sure that their needs are being met and, and that they're being able to address those situations where if we don't have books that are in a more multicultural environment, then the kids are only reading books on maybe one culture. So giving them that as well. And you could even include that in your own classmate books that you're using. So then it's important that we have them be able to somehow borrow, and yes, obviously checking out from not only their school library or the classroom library, but also their public library and giving them, the, <coughs> letting them know where that is and how they can get books. But if you have some take home books, again, it could be physical books, it could be digital, however you're doing that. You could um, send them to Storyline Online. Does anyone use storylineonline.net? Yeah, that was a fun one. It's where famous actors and actresses read the stories to them, and it's very cute. Um, Epic Books is a good one. Does anyone have access to Epic Books? Okay, so if you aren't familiar, just go to getepic.com, and if you're an educator, you can click on that tab, and you can, you'll have to log in and get a password and everything, but it's free to you as an educator. So getepic.com. And then, of course, a lot of your core basal programs also come with books. So I know sometimes I've seen people be like, why didn't it come with that? And then you open their closet, and they're all like still packaged. <laughs> like, oh, but it did. <laughs> So using all of them that you have. Also, if you have, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but sometimes when teachers retire, they'll go and sell their classroom libraries on eBay for like $200 and you get like 4,000 books. Take advantage. Like, check out eBay, see who's selling their books. Um, making sure we have some kind of comfortable place, and this is not only at school, but also at home to be reading these books, right? We want to be, as an adult, do you just like, go sit in a, like a hard chair like this, you're like, I'm gonna read in this really uncomfortable chair, it's gonna be great. No, like, when I'm gonna read, I'm curling up like by the fireplace with the blanket, and it's just really lovely and quiet, and so we have to give them those comfortable places to read, and we wanna make sure that whatever that place is, it's frequently visited by other adults, because they have to know that adults like to read too, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. It's also important that we, and this is, kind of goes back to that silent, sustained, tear, st silent, sustained staring, we want to make sure that they're actually reading. So um, our opportunities for children to engage in that independent reading level text, so we have to help them figure out what books are too easy, what texts are just right, and which ones are going to be too hard. Okay, so we have to give them that scaffolding and coach them on how to pick those books when we're looking at that. And, Making sure that whatever those books are, that they have some kind of response activity. That response activity could be a discussion, it could be a picture, it could be a written, uh, some kind of, but any, any way that they're actually processing what they gather from the book, so it's not just the silent, sustained staring, there's an actual reason for you to be looking at this text and reading it. So this is where you have some ideas of the story map. I'm sure some of you have seen these or writing about reading, so my favorite part. So you'll notice there are some, obviously, scaffolding, because we know in our younger grades, K1, that they do need a little more support in scaffolding and writing, um, but some kind of activities with it and giving them their choice. So I mean, it could be they could write about any of those things, they could make a story map, maybe they wanna draw a picture, give them that choice of how they wanna to respond to that text. Some of you might be familiar with uh, Willingham's books, Raising Kids Who Read, What Parents and Teachers Can Do. If you're, if you're not, I, Honestly, I cannot remember how much it costs, but someone can look it up on Amazon quickly. Feel free to let us know if you don't have to, but it's... When we're talking about the Matthew effect, it's the kids who read more are going to read more. Right? So when we're sending home those 20-minute parents <laughs> sign up for 20 minutes, we all know some parents are signing in anyway. 
We know some parents are um, looking at here the different, you know, you have five books in our house because maybe that's all they have. So those, that poor kid is like, I never want to read that book again. What are you thinking about that? $20 on Amazon. Oh, it's $20 on Amazon? Thank you. So yeah, it's not too expensive, but it, it gives you some great ideas on what you could be doing instead. Um, but thinking about if we know that the kids who are going to read at home are the kids that are going to read the class, they're, they're always getting the extra reading, but we have to figure out a way to engage the kids who aren't. So that's the, that's the real task we're looking at. So you'll notice in this picture, and this, again, tapped into that Meaningful Differences video that we talked about this morning, but telling stories not only to students, but eliciting stories from them. So as you all know, kids love to tell you stories, right? I mean, you're like, not now. <laughs> but find time to tell it to an adult. It doesn't have to be you. Maybe they're going to tell their story to a buddy. Maybe they're going to tell their story to a fourth grade buddy, because maybe you have some kind of buddy system already set up. Maybe they're going to tell their story to a parent volunteer whoever it's going to be, right? So it is important for them to get that oral language out and that back and forth of asking and answering questions and telling the story. And honestly, that, that adult can even help them with, because I know sometimes when kids tell stories, they're like, that cannot be the order that happened, and that's not possible. Sometimes the order is tricky for them, and having them understand that this is the order the story needs to go in when you're telling a story. Um, but remembering that talking really matters. That's very important, the oral language piece. So, also, nonfiction. So, these kids are like super intrigued with nonfiction because right now they're like in that why stage where they want to know why. Why does this happen? Why does a rhinoceros have a horn? And why does this and that? Um, so, they're already at that curiosity age where they really like nonfiction. So, let's go ahead and give them a lot of it, right? So, a lot of times we give them a lot of the storybooks, but let's make sure we're giving them enough nonfiction as well. So, those opportunities as well. They're so curious and interested. And then I know you're thinking, wow, games. Like, honestly, when I was a kid, my family would play board games and games like this all the time. And the discussion that went with it, the math skills sometimes included, or the spelling skills sometimes included, these have huge benefits for families to be doing. And if the family doesn't have them, maybe you can have some kind of game system where parents donate games to the classroom and they can be rented out for the weekend or that kind of thing, but that's another way to really earn some rich, not only reading and math, but also, again, that oral language and discussion and asking and answering questions. So playing games is, is a good, plus it's really fun. Playing games is super fun. Um, parents, making sure that kids need to see adults reading for fun, right? So reading for fun is a big deal. Like I know when I was growing up, and even now when I go home for Christmas, my parents are like just taking in books. It's, it's amazing. I'll buy my dad like a 600 page book, and he'll be like, oh yeah, I finished it in one day. And I'm like, you're like a freak, what's that? Um, but he does that. Like he will get so involved in the book, he cannot put it down, and he will literally sit there the whole day until it's done. So for me to have had that kind of situation that I was always viewing as a child, and even now as an adult, is very important. So. Having parents understand that it's important that the kids see not only the teachers reading, because obviously they see us reading all the time, but also parents doing it. Maybe it's even older siblings, siblings if, or a neighbor, or someone else that's living in the home with them. And then, I, this is a super cute picture, I like it. Um, but we want to send the message that reading is entertaining and magical, right? If we're saying you have to read exactly for 20 minutes, honestly, as an adult, if someone was like, you can only read tonight for 20 minutes, no more, no less. Oh, and by the way, it has to be on this book only. You'd be like, that's not happening. Right? That is not what we do. We sit down as adults and read. And reading can be super magical, and it can be very entertaining, and I hope that's why most of you are reading. Um, and it's not always just like because you're grading someone's paper. <laughs> um, but we want to make sure we're sending the message that it is entertainment. Right? It is a form of entertainment. And then this poor little girl. We don't want to make something that a child wants to do contingent upon reading. Because then reading is now that awful thing that you have to do, like a chore, before you can go play with your friends. Right? So the message we're sending when we do that is not good. So we don't want to be sending that message that you have to do this before you can do something fun, because that indicates that this isn't fun and it's a chore. We don't, that's really the message that we're sending kids when we're telling them this. So let's, let's not send that message. And then the last one, 
don't set a minimum amount of time. You wouldn't do that for one of the games, that's an option, right? You wouldn't be like, you can play apples to apples, but for only 20 minutes. Right, you'd play until you were done. And honestly, as adults, do some days, are you able to get like an hour of reading before bed, and you're like, this is so right. And the other days you're like, maybe I can finish this chapter, and then someone, like, a kid comes in, and you're like, never mind, it's not happening. Because some days it's not going to happen, right? Some days you're not going to get to it, and other days, maybe even on the weekends, you get an extended time to do it, Great, but no one at home is telling you you can only read for 20 minutes. Because we wouldn't do it. Especially if we're like, only this book. So be mindful about what we're doing and what kind of message we're sending kids about reading and reading at home and reading, thinking about that at your school. So I want you to just take one minute. I'm just going to give you one minute of think time. And I want you to be thinking about, okay, how can I change my reading homework or the way my classroom is set up to be able to not only have books and text to take home, but also games and audiobooks and other things. What other options can I bring into the table? And so the kids are like, it has to be exactly this book for 20 minutes every single night. So be thinking about how you could do something that might be more enriching and might stop that Matthew effect of the kids that want to read are going to read and the kids that are struggling are going to, are just aren't going to do it or don't have access. It's your lucky day. I am batting cleanup, and so I have the power right now. I'll tell you like I used to tell my students I taught um, mostly middle school. I am a special educator, and so I used to tell my students we can do this a couple different ways. You guys can stay on task, let's get this project done, and we can go to lunch five minutes early because I had that okie dokie. Or we can stay here the whole time. Doesn't matter to me either way. So we got 30 minutes here that we can either take 30 minutes or we can get go through this. You guys have to participate. And then we can get out of here early. Okay? Because beating the traffic is what always makes me happy. Alright, you are going to need for this this one little paper. It should be the only one left you haven't looked at today. It has a little dot at the top, it says something about being a junkie. That got you to look for it, didn't it? At Utah, and let me tell you about that really quick while you're finding it. At Utah Professional Development Network, um, our focus is on student outcomes. And so we have buttons and different things that say that we're outcomes junkies. Because people ask us, an outcomes junkie? Yeah, we want to see the student. So that's what that's <coughs> and if you're dying for a UPGN, I, I'm an outcomes junkie button. Let me know and I will hook you up. Okay, implementation planning. What are we going to do? You guys have been given tons of information. Just tons of information. Amazing information. I've, I'm actually grateful for the opportunity that I had that um, the state board invited us to come and present with them because we have learned a lot at UPDN, we do a lot of focus on special ed, and so we've had the chance to see the, the gen ed side of it from a completely different perspective, but we've also been able to give some input on the uh, special ed side as well. So they have given you information that is amazing, and now you have to go in that whole forest of paper that we've given you, you have a choice. You can go and put it on the shelf, with all the other PD information that you've been given, which, by the way, I'm still looking for somebody who may want a box of stuff from a Chris Tobani reading thing I went to about 12 years ago, because it's all still packed up, just like I brought it home. So if anybody wants that, let me know. But your decision now is, what am I going to do with this? How am I going to do this? How am I going to go ahead? I know I heard one group back here. They are ready to rock it Monday morning. They have a plan set up, they are ready to go, they're going to get this thing moving. Some of you, it may take a little bit longer, and what's reality? Monday's going to come, we're going to have all these great plans. This group that said this, I can see them doing it. They will rock it on Monday, but sometimes we have to take a little bit longer. So, This form that you have, oh wait, um, before we go into the form, sorry, I forgot to tell you this. Okay. So, 
See my little piggy friend here? You have to remember that the pig doesn't get any fatter just because you weigh it. Okay, think about that for a second. Just because I weigh it, doesn't make it any fatter. It's just like with a student, just because I present them with information doesn't mean they're going to get any smarter. I have to think about what I'm presenting to them, how I'm presenting it to them, and where they are at that point in time. So, now you can get this form out. And this form is going to kind of guide you to make some decisions. We're at the end, we're at the end of the day, a couple of days of a lot of information, a lot of ideas, and a lot of things we want to do, and a lot of benefits that we can see from the things that we've been shared. But we just want you to start with one thing, just one thing. We want you to take it back to your classroom, do one thing to start that change. And then when you get good at that one thing, add something else. And then keep going like that, and pretty soon you'll find that you've got a really good hookup. Is it going to happen all by the end of this year? No. But you guys know that. You've been around long enough to know that. So on this form, I'm just going to go through it really quickly, just so that you can kind of understand what it is, because sometimes forms are a little funky. So, all right. So if you um, look at the top part of it, and this is just going to go down in order, there is the reading domain targeted. So we want you to choose, there's one, two, three, four, five things that you guys talked about. Oh, comprehension, we might not have talked about it here. But PA, decoding, fluency, vocabulary. And so what you're going to do when we get done with this, or you can even do it now if you know, you're going to circle one thing that you want to start with. It can even be something that you're already doing that you want to do better. Sometimes we want to start adding a whole bunch of stuff and we don't, and then we're frustrated. How about we do something we're doing now, only better, or improve upon it, okay? So you're going to circle that. Then the next one is the practice name. So everybody calls things different things, um, different programs, different curriculum, different stuff. Call it something that you'll know what you're talking about, and then maybe some people who've been with you will know what you're talking about too. It may be something that you've used. Um, then we go on to critical practice features, and this is one of the big ones. What do you have to do in order for that um, practice to take place? What are the most important things included in that? So if you, for instance here, um, if we talked about defining terms, um, it needs to be in, in kid-friendly words. We need to have the kids make a connection, maybe physical gestures or pictures or something like that. What critical features, if you leave something out, that's going to make it so that it doesn't work? Those are critical features. So you want to list those critical features. There may be 5,000 of them, there may be three, but those critical features. Uh, then the description of teacher behaviors. Okay, this is a very, um, <clears throat> this is a very UPDN, probably special ed thing too. But when we have to describe a behavior or we have to set a goal or something for a student in IEP, we have to describe exactly what it's going to look like. Because otherwise, if I write it and then I give it to you and say this student needs to do this, if you have no idea what it looks like, you can't do it. And so what this description is here is if somebody walked into your room, let's say that you decided you were going to do some decoding stuff, and you were going to use this specific practice, and Sarah and Liz came to visit you. What are you going to be doing that they will be able to recognize that you're working on decoding? And not just because you said, okay, we're going to do decoding now, kids. But what are you doing? What are they going to see you doing? What does it look like in the classroom? By doing this, you're thinking through, how am I going to get to that point? How, what is this going to look like? What is it? I've got to practice this. I've got to, and I know that sounds funny, especially for those of you who've been doing this for years. But that practice means a difference, and especially if you're implementing something new. Practice it. Work with it. Work with the kids. Work with the um, co-teacher. Okay, then we have the description of the student behaviors. Again, 
If somebody walked into the room, what would they see the students doing if they were decoding? What does that look like? Um, when we plan our professional developments at UPDN, um, we, uh, we've learned a lot from the state. <laughs> but we've also, um, we start with the student. Our first question is to somebody who wants us to come and do professional development, we say, what do you want to see the students doing that they're not doing now? And as soon as they can articulate that, then we, then we start doing the, um, we start planning the PD. So if I want my students to be able to do this, what do I have to do as a teacher to get them to that point? So I want them to, this is what I want them to do in the very end. What do I got to do to get them to that point? And then you start looking at materials or activities or, you know, your content and stuff like that. That's, that's kind of how we plan it. Because really, we're not doing all this planning and everything else for us. We're doing it for the students. We want them to have um, the outcome. And if we're not thinking about what we want them to do first, then we're kind of planning for us. And have you ever had something really bomb that you thought, well, this is going to be awesome? And then you do it and it kind of goes, you went, oh, not so awesome. And we're going to go to recess or something else, right? It, uh, and it happens. But if you're thinking about what it's going to look like at the end first, you can go backwards. Um, it sounds, some of you have probably heard of it and stuff, but try it. It works really cool. Okay, then the, the needed resources. What do you need to do this um, lesson or activity or whatever you're doing? What things do you need? Because you guys probably know better than most teachers that if you don't have the stuff ready to go, you have lost the class for the rest of the day. And so it's, in junior high school, I had the same thing. I had this, oh man, I had the most awesome station thing planned for my math class, seventh and eighth grade. It was awesome. I spent hours setting it up and everything, had it all ready. The students came into the room. Mrs. A, what are you doing? You moved all the desk. What are we doing? I said, oh, you're going to love this. You're going to love this. So I assigned them all their stations. I said, go. I was waiting for the timer to go off. And the timer went off, and I said, OK, switch. And that was when I realized I didn't have all the supplies at every station. I had the first set for the first group. But I hadn't, they were over there, setting over there. And so I didn't have them. Well, guess what happened with a bunch of seventh and eighth grade boys? The end. And so we, um, we muddled through it. But you want to make sure all that stuff is ready to go. It's right there where you need it. And you know what you need. Um, OK, class time required. How much time are you going to schedule for this in your class? I, I know sometimes you think it's going to take, I, we're going to do this. We're going to work on this for 10 minutes. And you guys are probably much more organized than I am. But for me, usually that 10 minutes turns into about 15 or 20, and so then I'm thrown off for the whole rest of the day, and it's not, it, it just messes me up. And so, how much time am I going to block for that, and what are we going to be doing during that time? So, if you've done the, the student behavior and the teacher behavior, you pretty much got this done when you know how much time you have. Okay, then additional training or practice needed. Do you need some additional training? If you're going to do something new, do you need a little bit more information? Do you need a little bit more practice? Role play. I know you guys hate those words, role play, role play, role play. But the reality is when you're in the moment, um, you want to be able to just react to that. All right. We're getting there, guys. OK, measure for teacher effectiveness. How will you determine if what you did was fluent? A thing I'm very, very bad at is giving really good direct instructions. I will tell you how to do something, and my students actually got to the point where they would do this. They'd listen to me explain what we were going to do, and then they would wait. And I'd say, okay, get busy. But Mrs. A, you didn't tell us what we were doing. That was their way of reminding me, okay, you got it out, now tell us really what we're doing because they knew my instructions were not always 100% complete. And so it was, um, but how are you going to know that you had everything, that you did everything that you wanted to do? Because if you're trying to collect data, which you should be all the time, um, if you're trying to collect data and you didn't do it fluently, is the data valid? 
No, you probably didn't even get data. You got something, but you didn't get data. Okay, then measure for student effectiveness. Again, how are you going to know the students did it? Um, and then it affected their outcome. You're going to teach them this, this content, and you want them to give this product that goes back to the process, content process product and learning environment. You have this content. They're going to do this, and this is the product they're going to give you. How are you going to know that they learned something? Is your product, is your end product design so that it measures that they learned something? Or did they just all get the um, wonky arms on the leprechaun or whatever it is? I'm not making fun of you guys, I'm just saying that's, that's an end product too. And what was the purpose of that or what's the purpose of this? So when you're talking about student effectiveness, what do I want them to learn and how am I going to know they learned it? So it, that's where your progress monitoring, are, and not, I can't believe I said that, that's where your formative assessments come in, is knowing where they are at any one time. And then the steps to prepare to use the practice. So in other words, um, what am I going to do? Where am I going to start? What's the first thing I've got to do? It's kind of your to-do list, your checklist. What do I got to do to set this all up so that I can um, be successful and so that this practice can go out? Okay, that was a lot of information. There's questions to the right-hand right -hand side of this that kind of guide you in these. This is in the handouts that they've given you. And once you use this a few times, it becomes, you're like, okay, then you're, it's the automaticity and, and you're going to plan that way. Um, you'll find that when you walk up there to do that, you're more successful because you're ready for it. You can handle anything. And that way, as things come up within the class, as far as classroom management stuff, boom, 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 you're ready to go with that. So, any questions? They're all like, no way, man. She said we could get out of here early on this thing, and I'll shoot whoever says something. So, any questions? Okay. So, before you're allowed to leave, and I have that power, um, <laughs> before you're allowed to leave, what I want you to do is circle one of the things that you're going to focus on, and I want you to write one critical feature, and then at the very bottom, I want you to write a focus date for when you're going to use that content. It could be tomorrow, it could be six months from now, it doesn't matter to me, but I want you to write a focus date. Because you know if you write a goal and you don't set a date, it doesn't happen. Yes, so the top circle one of those areas that you want to work on and then write one critical feature from it, so something that has to be done. So a, a critical feature, um, okay, I'm trying to think when it comes to literacy. Um, somebody help me out. Critical feature of something we're doing in, in PA. It's one of the things you have to do. What's that? Initial sounds, so what's, um, in order to get ready for that, or in order to present that, what has to be included in that lesson? Tell me one thing that has to be included in that lesson. That's a critical feature, okay? And then at the bottom, the date by when you're going to use this, okay? And then you guys can fill in the rest later. But, <laughs> all right, are you guys all planned and ready to go? You got your stuff done? You learned a lot? You got your forest with you? Miss Sarah, Miss Liz? Uh-oh, Liz is coming up. It's not my fault this time. Uh-uh, I was ready to go. <laughs> Thank you, guys. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody got the information in the email. There was a link to the Google Drive folder, and then there was also a link for a survey. It's very brief, but it's very helpful if you can provide some feedback for us. We do take that into consideration. Like you'll see if you access the Google Drive, the presentations that are in there are not exactly the same as what you saw yesterday and today because we've refined some things. We're going to 
try to, as soon as we get access, upload the correct presentations for you. So those will be in there. And if you could just please take some time to fill out that survey, we'd really appreciate it. And feel free to contact any of us if you have any questions. Okay? Thank you.